Bonjour tout le monde, j'espère que vous allez bien. On se retrouve aujourd'hui pour Zach en Rolib USA, quatrième épisode. Je suis ravi de vous retrouver, hein, les amis. C'est la bonne humeur, c'est mardi soir. Je sais que les mardis, en général, c'est l'horaire à laquelle on est habitué. En plus, on est en direct à Dallas, des locaux d'Optic Gaming. Voilà, on est dans une petite pièce de réunion, ça fait très plaisir. Mais c'est un Zach en Rolib, je sais que vous l'attendiez. Ça a été deux semaines très, 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 très prenantes, les gars. Entre euh, Ludwig, Temper, euh, Cream Six, il y a deux jours, qui est passé nous donner un Zach de 3 heures quasiment et aujourd'hui un invité je sais que vous attendez c'est un bonheur pour moi pour quiconque a suivi Call of Duty et pour quiconque a suivi la scène c'est vraiment énorme et on va essayer de vous préparer et de vous donner une bonne émission en tout cas on s'est décarcassé pour j'espère que vous allez bien est-ce que vous allez bien le chat là comment vous allez je les vois là il y a du green wall dans le chat là Zach j'en peux plus d'attendre c'est lourd ça fait plaisir mais en attendant je vais quand même prendre un tout petit instant pour remercier nos amis de WeWard. Vous avez vu, il y a leur logo, c'est la marque qui nous a suivis pour Zacorolib USA. C'est une application qui vous permet de gagner de l'argent en marchant, c'est tout simple. Il y a déjà plus de 10 millions d'utilisateurs, le lien est dans le chat. Il y a même également le petit point d'exclamation WeWard. Vous avez le lien avec le code Zach WeWard, vous pouvez le mettre à votre inscription, ça vous permettra de gagner des bonus supplémentaires. C'est totalement gratuit, donc n'hésitez pas, ils soutiennent l'initiative et ça fait super plaisir de les avoir avec nous. C'est important d'avoir des marques pour nous suivre et pour pouvoir faire ces projets. Donc donc je les remercie, gros merci à WeWard également dans le chat, c'est les boss, voilà, je les vois dans le chat, vous êtes là, vous les remerciez, c'est lourd. Alors pour ceux qui ne me demandent pas de scump, malheureusement, je suis obligé de vous répondre non, parce que il a malheureusement eu une sorte de petit tournage qui s'est calé, ce qui fait qu'avec le fait qu'on parte jeudi, ça n'a pas pu se faire. J'ai eu Crime Six, je trouve que c'est quand même assez cool niveau Pro Call of Duty, mais aujourd'hui, pas de Pro Call of Duty, on va avoir quelqu'un du côté un peu plus effectif, un peu plus business, un peu plus on va dire opérationnel parce que aujourd'hui je suis avec Hector X, le créateur et un des fondateurs de la structure Optic Gaming. Hello X, how are you? I am doing great. It was a pleasure to hear you speak the way that you just did. So it's a pleasure to meet you. Ah, it was in French. I had like to give all the information at once at the beginning of the show, you know. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for coming. Uh, how was your weekend? My weekend was really good. We just came off a really good championship week in Halo. Uh, world Championships, foremost accomplishment was something that I, it was heartfelt for me. Let's go. What, what did you think when... Uh, parce que pour vous dire, les gars, c'est la, la première personne, c'est lui qui a accepté de venir en tout premier quand je lui ai proposé. Uh, what did you think when a couple months ago, I sent you a message, uh, it was like night time in France, to tell you, okay, Hector, we haven't spoke and seen each other in a long time. Uh, I'm gonna come with my team. Are, we, are you okay to make this? Uh, what did you think when you saw the message at first? I was excited. Uh, not a lot of people are doing what you're doing and I'm always all about fun and being able to help somebody else out. Uh, and happy that you took the time to visit the United States. Yeah, yeah. like I, we came to Dallas in Dallas like a couple days ago, and uh, we went to downtown Deep Elam, the main like uh, the, the main neighborhood, and it was actually fine, fine. I, I prefer Dallas than Los Angeles. Yeah, same. Me too. Los Angeles, Los Angeles. So we're, we're gonna go through a lot of this. Comme d'habitude, les amis, pour uh, la traduction, nous avons Alice. Alice, tu es là? Tout va bien? Ouais, salut tout le monde, salut le chat. Voilà, et salut Alice, elle va encore faire le travail pour faire en sorte que vous puissiez comprendre tout si vous ne parlez pas anglais. Et puis si vous parlez anglais, on va essayer bien entendu de faire en sorte de parler doucement pour que vous puissiez gentiment tout comprendre. Je lui disais que j'aimais bien Dallas et que je préférais Dallas à Los Angeles. Et donc, on va pouvoir démarrer gentiment. I have a classic with my show. Uh, it's a classic like, a, I think that just just to know a little bit more about you. So I'm going to be asking to you just to start off. Um, tell us, can you tell us more like about you? Like, who are you? Where do you come from? And what did you study? What is like your educational background? Um, so my educational background is uh, graduated from high school, did one semester in college, which okay. is university, uh, but it was a junior college. So not really any major uh, university. Do I pause for those 40 seconds right after no, there? No, you just, can just, just go, go ahead. Okay, cool. then, uh, don't worry, Alice is here. She takes notes. Okay. And, and she then just... She, okay, perfect. Give everything. Right, I just want to make sure that I'm following the rules because uh, mm -hmm. I, I do want my my messaging to to my French people out there that haven't seen us in person in such a long time. Let's go. Uh, we miss going to French events. The, G, uh, the ESWC, was it? The yes. ESWC. They need to come back because uh, we we loved going going to uh, to per, to Paris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like it was a couple of years ago, but I know that there were a lot of optic fans as well in Paris. 
Yeah, it was it was uh, it was a good time. Obviously, us having the chance to to visit worldly places with uh, through video games was something that was like a dream come true. But to to go back to where I, I'm, my name is Hector Rodriguez, also known as Opticax. Uh, I am the the founder of Optic Gaming. Um, I was born in El Paso, Texas, uh, so eight hours from where we sit today. But I lived in Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, Mexico. Okay. So I grew up in Juarez, Mexico for 13 years. Uh, at 13 years old, my parents kidnapped me and took me to the coldest place on earth called Chicago, Illinois. <laughs> uh, and, and that's where I've been for 27 winters. You don't say 27 years. You say 27 winters. Okay. Because how cold it is. So spent there. I always knew that I was going to come back to Texas. Um and who I am, I am a creative person. I, okay. I, I love, uh, I've been an artist all of my life, a graffiti artist for the majority of my, my teenage years uh, into my like early 20s. And uh, I wanted to find creative outlets and making montages and on Call of Duty was, was one of them. Like it was a part of your like pro creational process? That's right. Like it was a way for you to express it? Yeah, so graf what gra graffiti taught me Uh, and what, what graffiti taught me was that you can make a brand for yourself and, and people who have similar like-minded sort of thoughts can relate to that. And word of mouth is very important. Uh, and when I brought that into gaming, it sort of gave me a leg up in, in gaming. Well, how was the life in like Ciudad Juarez? Is it the city that is like uh, cut in half with El Paso? Like there is a side in the Mexican, uh, like in Mexico and one side in the US? No. But sort of. So I, it's it's. Um, I was born in El Paso, Texas, and then 15 minutes the other way is where I lived. It's uh, the Rio Grande, which uh, is the border of of the. I mean, Chihuahua Juarez has been in every single cartel movie that's ever you know almost existed. So that was a game, I think. Call of Juarez, if you remember. That's right. Yep, yep, yep. Call of Juarez was a game. Yeah. Uh, and how was life uh, right there? Uh, humble, humble beginnings. Uh, it, it was a, it's a regular city in, in, in Mexico. I, I will say that, that the people there, me, me growing up there was one of the best, uh, uh, experiences that I've ever had. Uh, I wouldn't trade my childhood for anything. The, okay. the, the humble beginnings always, you know, sort of set me apart, I believe, because it, it gave me, uh, a, a look at what, what real life is and then what we do on a daily basis, which is a dream come true. Of course. Of course, of course. I, I really think, like, I'm really happy that you speak about it because, like, when I have, uh, like, some uh, people, some guests right here, they, they speak about, like, the, their French childhood or, or because they've mostly been born in France or maybe Belgium. Having someone who was born in the U.S., raised in Mexico and then in Chicago, there's, like... It's a completely different, I think, mindset and the stuff. It's really, really interesting. I know that, like, uh, actually, I, I've made my research. Um, you are 42, I think, years old. And so you had, like, kind of a life before esports. Can oh, you yeah. tell us about what you, well, you have been doing before yeah. going into esports and uh, video games? I had lived an entire life, right? I, I, was, I was a grown adult. I had a regular job. I was first in mortgages and then the insurance company. And then the magic of the internet, YouTube and Call of Duty stepped into my life. So I had already, I already knew what my life was going to be for the rest of my life. I was going to go into an office. I was going to wear a suit and a tie. And I was, and that's what I wanted to do growing up. Growing up, I, you know, coming from the humble beginnings that I did and, and my parents sacrificing as much as they did to move us to the United States, I knew that I had no other choice but to be successful. And, you know, being an immigrant into the, being a, an American born immigrant, Uh, I, I, I knew what my task was. I knew that I had to make my family proud. And one of the ways to do that is being successful because money uh, alleviates a lot of the pains. So I knew that I had to make as much of the opportunity that my parents provided for me. So I always wanted to wear a suit. I attributed wearing a suit with money. Yes. Wearing a suit with like uh, the fact, like um, an accomplishment, an, an achievement. Achievements, yes. Achievement. Est-ce que tu pourrais nous, nous traduire un petit peu tout ça, s'il te plaît, Alice Ouais, bien sûr. Euh, alors, bah, il s'est présenté en disant que, euh, voilà, c'était Hector, euh, qu'il avait 42 ans, comme tu l'as dit, euh, qu'il a... En fait, il est né aux états unis du coup, euh, au Texas, et en fait, euh, après, il est tout de suite parti euh, au Mexique. Euh, c'est un peu à la frontière euh, avec les états unis d'après ce que j'ai compris. Ouais, c'est ça. Il a vécu là-bas jusqu'à ses 13 ans. 
Donc, euh, il, a, il a eu une super enfance, même s'il si, euh, venait d'une famille qui n'était pas très, très riche. Bah, il échangerait ça pour rien au monde. Il en garde vraiment des très bons souvenirs. C'est ça. Et après, en fait, euh, ses parents l'ont pris à 13 ans et ils sont partis à Chicago. Il a dit c'est l'endroit le plus froid du monde. J'ai passé 27 ans là-bas. Il a même dit que ça faisait 27 hivers tellement il faisait froid. The coldest après, city on earth. <rire> exactement. Et après, il est revenu, euh, il est revenu au Texas. Et euh, comme tu lui disais, il a 42 ans, il a sûrement eu une carrière avant l'e-sport, donc euh, il, en, il en a un peu parlé, il disait qu'il était dans, dans l'assurance et qu'il avait vraiment une vie euh, bah, banale. Quoi. Il se levait le matin, il mettait son star et hop, il allait au travail. Parce que pour lui, c'était vraiment hyper important d'utiliser l'opportunité que ses parents avaient pris et tous les sacrifices qu'ils avaient faits pour venir du Mexique jusqu'aux états unis pour réussir dans la vie. Donc pour lui, c'était hyper important de pouvoir faire de l'argent, euh, pouvoir... Euh, aider sa famille du mieux possible, c'est un peu ça. une sorte de remerciement. Quoi. Le fait de porter, pour, te, pour vous dire ce qu'il a dit, le fait de porter un costard, c'était une sorte de si, euh, signe de réussite. Tu vois, comme quelque chose, de, on a de l'argent, j'ai réussi, c'est cool. Il devait avoir cette vie un petit peu tracée. Were you like, uh, did you have, a, uh, have you taken like a hit by the 2008 crisis, maybe? Because if you are in the mortgage, I think mm -hmm. maybe yeah. it was related. Yeah, look, uh, my, my, my life has, had already been set. I already knew that I was going to be going to work every single day day and doing something that I didn't want to do. And once the markets crashed, it, it came down hard on everybody, especially people that worked in that industry. Uh, to give you an example how bad it got, when I was 26 years old, I bought my first house. By the time that, uh, that's, that's actually the same, the same year that I joined Optic. Um, by the time 2009 had, 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 had come, uh, we had already gone through a recession in which I had to give back my home and two of my vehicles. So sort of a complete reset. Okay. Uh, I, I went from making $180,000 a year. And that's a lot for a regular civilian. Of course. I mean, that's a lot, period. Um, and then back to like a normal 35 to 40,000. So, you know, it was, it was a lot for, for, for somebody like me who had thought that he had accomplished what he needed to accomplish and then all of a sudden have it all ripped away from me. Was it really difficult? Maybe you already had the family at the, t uh, the time, no? You no, were we, alone? We, we, my, my wife and I were about to start our family, Judith. Judith and I were about to start our family and uh, it, You know, it, it, it sort of worked out in the end, but that, those moments were really hard for us. OK. Pour vous dire, je lui ai demandé si son travail, parce qu'il était dans les assurances, etc., a été frappé par la crise de 2008. Il a dit que oui, il avait une maison et deux voitures, il a dû tout rendre. Et il était à 150 000 dollars de salaire annuel, il est passé à 40 000. Tant de dire que ça frappe pour beaucoup de personnes. It's a really, really good story because I, I know in France, like this crisis has hit uh, a lot of people. Uh, like it hit, uh, it was a worldwide crisis, but I know it started in the US. So yeah. uh, being in the mortgage and stuff, I, I really think it was maybe a bit hard. You know, we're going to switch a little bit. I'm going to ask you, how did you start playing video game and more specifically Call of Duty? I couldn't tell you. I've always had an affinity for sniper movies. Okay. And I always liked the sniper uh, part of, of, of the movie, right? The guy in the shadows, the guy in the background, the guy that, you know, that, that is there but not there. Uh, and I wanted to sort of experience that on my own. And Call of Duty had a really good, Call of Duty 2 specifically had a good uh, sniper rifle. Um, and, the or, or, the, no, no, that's uh, Call of Duty 4. Call of Duty 2 had Car 98. Uh, Lee Enfield, uh, the uh, Moist Nugget, and the American, which was the the Springfield. Let's go! Shout out to this dude. He knows what's <laughs> up. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I, it 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 sort of became a decompressor. I would I would have this like long stressful day at work, mm -hmm. and when I got home, all I wanted to do was escape. All I wanted to do was like sort of. Let, let the world, the reality of the world go somewhere else. And I wanted to experience something that brought happiness to me. But the second that the competitive aspect of Call of Duty became uh, what it was, I became even more intrigued and I became even more passionate because it was all about, for me, it was all about, you know, mastering a craft. And then when I started making videos and, 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 and realized that that could be a creative outlet for me, that's when it really got interesting for me. Call of Duty 2. Like uh, the Tujan, I think it was there is a My map called Tujat. Tujan where uh, you could already snipe, there were already the first montage and stuff. That's right. That's when you started? Yeah. Uh, well, at that time, uh, Grizz, uh, legendary Zerg Grizz, had already started making montages. And that's where we, I think that that's where everybody sort of spawned. I, I think by that point, all of the competitions that were happening, that were happening on PC for, for Call of Duty, Um, in, in Europe, hadn't made it over to, uh, over to the United States. So that was good because it sort of allowed us to create our own style and do 
what we could with what we had because PC was way stronger than Xbox 360. Yes. So the graphics weren't as good as they were on PC, but the community was just thriving here in the United States. So that gave everybody the opportunity to to sort of rethink the way that they were doing it. At the time, there was no money to be made. At the time, it was just a creative outlet. A, passion. A passion, something to share with other people, like-minded individual community. Um, and then it, 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 it sort of lended itself to be a, a platform and a way for people to change their lives, as it were. Why do you think, like, it's a, a real question because I think it's still something that is not, I think, maybe not that true anymore, but that was at the time. Why do you think, like, the console games were, like, really big in the US and the PC was maybe a little bit, like, uh, uh, I think I'm going to say slower, uh, slow, sorry. And then uh, in Europe, there was a big console scene as well, but there was, it was more about, like, PC and stuff, the computers and stuff. What, what yeah. do you think? Uh, just maybe a cultural thing? Yeah, I, th I think it was about the economies, right? Uh, the, 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 the economy of whatever country you're in had a lot to do with whether or not you played a console game or a PC game. If you bought a PC, there's multi-use for that. You could use it for gaming, but you could also use it for school and you could use it for work. So you get three uses out of it. We're here in the United States. You know, you gave your kid a gift of a console, which was only used for that. And eventually it turned into an entertainment unit where you can watch Netflix and all that stuff. But at the time, it was strictly and only for gaming. Ah là 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 là. Je lui ai posé ces questions. Comment est-ce qu'il a commencé Call of Duty? Pourquoi est-ce qu'il pense qu'il y avait plus de PC en Europe et plus de consoles aux états unis Alice, je te laisse nous traduire tout ça. Yes, alors il a commencé à dire qu'il avait découvert Call of Duty, enfin, c'était un peu par hasard parce que lui il a toujours aimé beaucoup les, les films d'action avec les snipers et tout, puis il s'est rendu compte que Call of Duty 2 du coup ce qu'il disait, ouais, exactement. Euh, ça, avait, ça avait exactement ça, et en fait ça lui permettait après une dure journée de travail de rentrer et de, de décompresser, de se déconnecter complètement de la réalité et d'oublier tous les problèmes qu'il pouvait avoir dans la vie et au travail. Avec le classique, en fait, les snipers de l'époque sur Call of Duty 2, euh, sur tout Jeanne, le Springfield, plein d'armes qui parlent de fou, et ça a été d'ailleurs les début des montages sur Call of Duty, tu peux continuer Ouais, c'est exactement ce qu'il disait, du coup il s'est mis à faire des montages avec les vidéos et en fait il s'est rendu compte que ça pouvait devenir une vraie passion parce que comme il le, dis, il le disait au tout début, il est hyper créatif et il a fait beaucoup de graffitis et tout et que pour lui c'était vraiment, euh, c'est vraiment, bah, devenu sa passion, quoi. il pensait pas que ça allait, ça allait vers ça et avec la communauté qui grandissait, bah, il s'est rendu compte avec d'autres personnes que c'était une sorte de passion en commun et qu'il pouvait continuer à le faire et potentiellement à, à en vivre après. Quoi. Mais qu'au début, c'était pas du tout, pas du tout pour l'argent, c'était vraiment parce qu'il aimait faire ça. Exactement, exactement. Et il pense aussi qu'il y avait plus de PC euh, en Europe parce que justement, vu qu'il y avait peut-être un petit peu le côté économique d'avoir plusieurs utilités avec un PC, en Europe, c'était un petit peu comme ça, alors qu'aux états unis c'était plus le classique, j'offre une console à mon fils et ensuite, euh, on verra ce qu'il en fait. Bon, en gros, il joue. Il n'y a, a, a pas 150 autres choses à mentionner. Uh, in 2007, you joined like Optic Gaming, uh, the sniper team created by G and Crew, I think. Uh, like, maybe... Mm -hmm. you You t no, it wasn't. I'm I'm lost. Like I I I got it wrong. A little bit. Let's go. So, a little bit. Just tell us. So I I joined a game battles team called Optic. Right. Uh, the sniping thing hadn't happened yet. Okay. Um. I I joined it at first as a as a referee a, a refereed Call of Duty competitive matches, Call of Duty two competitive matches, and then after that because of the friendship that I developed with uh, with the people that were in Optic at the time. Um. And me being the age that I was, I was able to sort of join just as a fun thing to do after work. It was it wasn't a business. It wasn't it, it was literally just a pickup team uh, the same way that you and your friends might, you know, play. Um, when we started making videos, that's that's what well, actually when I took over Optic completely. And that, that's when I sort of uh, identified that there was a space that I can provide something to. And Sniper, as you know, was my favorite weapon in the game and my brother also uh was also very huge into sniping and then from there we were sort of like what if we just create a sniping only team and at the time there was none right there was the, none. didn't exist so i was like i'm like that's pretty good right like if we if we're able to sort of create a team that is very hard to get into and we're going to keep it to only 10 member stops no more than 10 Uh, and that's how we got to the first seven and the first seven sort of led into something completely else. Uh, but when I first joined, it was, again, it was nothing. It was just a team that, that people used to play game battles matches with. It, it wasn't until, um, 
I took over that we sort of started to make the YouTube videos that would then transcend and sort of set the path for the rest of Call of Duty Esports as well. At that time, like uh, you, you buff everything, like the HDPVR and stuff to start doing it. Like, you, oh, yeah. like it was a, a, a requirement for the member that joined to have one, like to be able to, no. to play, to record. No, I, I, as long as they were good. My, my, the first thing is like, if you're good, right? Because I wanted to, to, to get the established, we're the best first at sniping. And then after that, we were recorded. And since at the time, I was like the only one that was old enough or an adult to be able to purchase a Dazzle and then an HD PVR, um, I, I was able to sort of like spectate matches for them and then sort of record for them and okay. sort of send them footage. And I, sometimes I would edit all of that stuff myself. I would make montages for my friends for them to sort of send out uh, throughout their, their YouTube channels. And then, uh, you know, when when Christmas came along or when birthday came along, they would ask their parents to buy them the, the, the rest of the stuff. Uh, the classic. So the team like was filled at first with sniper players. You wanted the best sniper players. And then when you had them, the sniper players that like made maybe like crush the public and stuff, maybe even private matches or game battles, game battle competitive matches. When you had them, then you felt you could do some content and you went ahead for it. Yeah, you know what it was? I, I understood that in the competitive side of Call of Duty, which we came from, there was nothing that pointed towards content. And at the time, the only people that were creating content was like Grizz and he was just making montages. And I'm like, well, I want to do that too. And my brother was actually the one that sort of pointed us towards like, hey, let's go, let's get away from competitive and let's just focus on making videos around sniping. And and I said, you know, that's that's a great idea. Let's let's go down that path. Uh, but, you know, what 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 truly set us apart was the fact that we we sort of had the opportunity to to be the first yes. and because of that we had the you know that's all we did we just practiced 1v1s every single day on shipment on shipment iron sharpens iron and 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 we knew that we were the best and if we can compete against each other over and over nobody had a chance because nobody was practicing as much as we were so that's that's where the leg up came from were you good at 1v1 on shipment uh me Yeah, at the time, I, I think I retired 1v1s when I had like 500 wins with like uh, like 17 losses. <laughs> yeah, like people, because I'm older now and because I've been around for long enough that people always forget and don't give me credit for the mastery that came from these hands. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> ah, ça c'était passionnant, Alice. Fais leur le récap parce que c'était adorable. Euh, ouais, alors du coup, euh, il a dit qu'il avait commencé en fait, euh, donc euh, il a repris ta question en disant que tu t'étais trompé. Ouais, c'est vrai. Et du coup, euh, il a dit qu'en euh, 2007, du coup, il avait, il avait rejoint en fait euh, Optique, mais en tant qu'arbitre, euh, c'était vraiment un truc, euh, c'était pas payé, hein, c'était juste par passion. Vraiment, ouais, c'était sur une fiche game battle euh... pour ceux qui connaissent. En gros, c'était les sites où on pouvait faire des petits matchs entre joueurs. Voilà, c'était ça, en gros. Ouais, c'est ça. En fait, il faisait ça juste après le, le travail. Et en fait, euh, bah, il s'est fait plein de potes dans le milieu. Il a commencé à avoir euh, des, des gens euh, de la structure et tout. Et en fait, euh, comme c'était le, le plus vieux, c'était lui qui pouvait acheter tout le matos pour euh, faire le vidéo editing, les montages et tout. Et du coup, en fait, bah, il s'occupait de faire ça pour tout le monde. Et euh, après, bah, du coup, ils ont voulu monter une équipe de, de sniping, mais ils voulaient que ça soit hyper... Euh, restrictif, c'était seulement genre les meilleurs et compétitif. Euh, en, mode, euh... en gros, avant de ouais. vouloir faire des vidéos, ils voulaient être les meilleurs au sniper avant d'avoir des mecs qui font du contenu. Et une fois qu'ils ont été les meilleurs au sniper, à s'entraîner, à faire des 1v1 et tout, là, ils ont fait du contenu. Ouais, exactement, c'est ce qu'il disait. Et en fait, il était, il était un peu dégoûté parce qu'il disait on aurait pu être les premiers si on, <rire> si on avait pu, si on avait pu le faire avant, on aurait été les premiers, quoi. Exactement, exactement. Et donc du coup, en fait, derrière, ils ont commencé à faire du contenu un petit peu, petit à petit, parce qu'ils se sont dit que c'était les premiers à faire. Et je lui ai demandé, et toi, t'étais bon en 1v1 sur Shipment Il m'a dit, mec, j'avais une fiche Game Battle avec 501 victoires, 18 défaites. 17 défaites, je crois. Autant dire que... You were a good player. Like, uh, maybe... The... No, they don't give you the credit you deserve. Yeah. Definitely. I'm, I'm still a good player. If I had the, the time. Uh, not pro level, right? I mean, that's, that's reserved for the... For the... For the gifted by by somebody else, uh, but I, you know, I, I think at the time I was a, a, an above average player, definitely, uh, and only because of the amount of time that I was focusing on that, and I had to play a lot in order to get as much footage as I wanted to, in order to create the videos that were going to entertain people. And the community started to sort of build around that. What also happened is that because of those videos, other people started to team up together and create their own sniper teams because, it, you know, they, although they wanted to join Optic, I had made it a very early rule with all of us that it was very exclusive. Of it was course. an exclusive club. So people are like, well, if we can't join them, 
beat them. Let's create our own stuff and try to beat them. And that's where NSF, which was a no scope fury, I think NSF, um, uh, who else? I mean, obviously, phase late, like a little bit later on, but I, I like, would say sort there maybe. Yeah, they, no, those, those came after. It was after. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think NSF, uh, top notch multimedia had like their own little thing going on. Remember oh, them? The top notch multimedia. I remember Azar yeah. Cinema and stuff. It was the big YouTube channels at the yeah, time. You remember? Yeah, Ebonics, uh, Six Sins, um, VGI Dynamite. You know, th those dudes. Um, they, they did like, they did their thing. And for me, I, I, I sort of saw, saw this thing developing and it was, it was, it was good from, I, I don't know where it came from. Maybe it's again, the imagination that I have as a creative person sort of saw this thing evolve through the years before it even happened. I, 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 I'm not saying I predicted it. Mm. Right. But I, I sort of understood because it made sense that it would take a path okay. that, that it did. You, you felt it. Yeah, I did. I did. I did feel it. It's it's really nice. Like I, I uh, when I prepared this show, I went like to uh, through your first video. So like I heard your first commentary and stuff. It uh, it's like fun times. And uh, Alex, let's have the comment. Uh, I went through one of your like your first Modern Warfare 2 video. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to take a quick moment to show you something. Maybe you're not even aware of uh, on your first Modern Warfare 2 video. Like you made a video to uh, show uh, how uh, like the new kill cams because yeah. the kill cams were uh, new at the time when uh, a team death match ends there was a kill mm -hmm. cam and on this video in one of the comments you can see et là on va mettre uh, uh, just have a look you can just go uh, <laughs> Ali A 12 years ago <laughs> on one of, of your first video là tu peux montrer la vidéo on one of your first video on Modern Warfare 2 just to show how kill cam works <laughs> It's crazy. When I just saw that and I saw Ali in your comments, I was like, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, his name at the time was Matriox or Matriox, something like that. Um, you know, if, 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 you look at, if you look at the opportunity that I've had to sort of collaborate with people, uh, I, was, I was lucky enough to, to have the foresight to start the YouTube channel. And if you look throughout the, throughout the history of, of, of my videos, you'll see that you know, very early on, I was already interacting with people who then became one of the biggest ever, right? Like the, from that video, I created a series called Top 5 Kill Camps of the Week on Machinima. What up, Machinima? Big up to Hex here coming at you with another Top 5 Kill Camps of the Week. And on the first episode, uh, the guy that got the number one spot was FPS Russia, right? FPS well, Russia? <laughs> who became FPS Russia in, in, in uh, you know, eventually. At the time, he was FPS Kyle, but then... So a, a lot of people that interacted with, with Optic very early on sort of went on to be, you know, some of the biggest people in, in, um, in that. What, what, what I will say like early on or right now, it's, is the, uh, one of the things I'm most proud of is, is the fact that we did a really good job of sort of empowering our teammates to become, you know, major players in the space. Uh, you know, from look at a hundred thieves, right? My, my, my young brother, nature, he came, he came from optic and, you know, we, we sort of built this thing, uh, together that, that, that will outlast us hopefully. And now the, what he's built with a hundred thieves, right. was sort of using the same, the same mentality and the same approach is something that I'll always be proud of. Right. If you look at Fwiz, right. Fwiz went from being the head of yes. gaming at, at Google, uh, or YouTube, uh, heading up gaming and VR and AR, and now he's the CEO of Polygon Studios, like one of the most revolutionary Web three properties that is that that's you know that that's coming down the pipeline. Uh, and I can go like down all of these rabbit holes where if you look up, you know, we were one of the first people to find Doctor Disrespect, right? If if you look it up, like twelve years ago. A friend of mine, D Treats, you guys remember D Treats, obviously the, yes, the best. Yes, Optic D Treats. Yeah, the best sniper in my opinion ever. Um, he he sort of discovered uh, Doctor Disrespect, and then we started collaborating with, collaborating with him very early on. He was way ahead of his time, right? Think about it. If you think about twelve years ago, it's when he first started Doctor Disrespect. But it wasn't until four years ago, or five years, or yeah, like four years ago, that he really became who he became. So that means that he was ten years ahead of his time, which is a good indicator for anybody out there who's experimenting and trying something that. Just because it's not working today, it doesn't mean that it isn't something that will work in the future. And patience will allow you to truly, truly ex uh, explore what you could be if you give yourself a chance. In this sense, don't you think that sometimes some people are right, but maybe too early? Yeah. And then they just stop and miss on something? Yeah. That happens all the time. 
people people want results right away and that's never the way that life works you know it, it, it optic didn't become what it is today if 14 years didn't happen if in the beginning of all of this let's say on year four call it you know black ops one if i said you know what i'm not getting i'm not getting paid enough i need to get another job uh, or I want to go make documentaries surrounding graffiti. This was a conversation that I had where I was going to quit Optic uh, during Black Ops 1 because of the sniping, which just wasn't my thing. I was bored of it. Yeah, uh, the L L96, uh, it wasn't your weapon. What's that? The, L yeah, L96. L96. Yeah, they, <laughs> yeah Treyarch hated snipers <laughs> back in the day. Uh, but, you know, I, I could have quit, but, if I, but I didn't. I gave myself a chance and, you know, the, the fruits of that labor sort of Became what, what Optic is today. Les amis, vous allez avoir un discours de motivation là et de, de, de leçons de vie magnifique. Alice, je te laisse leur retranscrire tout ça. Ouais, euh, alors du coup, euh, il disait que, euh, en fait, ce qui était vachement bien avec, euh, avec Optic, c'est qu'il avait pu être un peu le précurseur et voir énormément de gens débuter leur carrière et, euh, et évoluer en tant que personne connue maintenant de, de la scène. Euh, il a cité plein, plein, plein de noms. Euh, donc, il parlait de Night Shot avec 100 Tips, par exemple. Fouise. Euh, Docteur Disrespect. Fouise, c'est ça Exact. Euh, et euh, en fait, euh, que, que lui, au, au départ, bah, tout, est, tout avait été fait euh, par, euh, par passion et que du coup, ça le rendait super fier parce que tous ces gens-là, il les avait découverts. Donc, il parlait de, de sa chaîne YouTube en disant qu'en fait, tous les gens qui avaient dans les commentaires, tous les gens qui avaient interagi avec lui, bah, maintenant, c'est tous des gens connus. C'est ça. Donc, et euh, tous les gens avec qui ils avaient travaillé à l'époque, au final, ils ont réussi à faire quelque chose. Fouise est devenu le head of, his, of, head of uh, uh, video game sur YouTube et après, maintenant, il est chef d'une autre compagnie. Euh, Docteur Disrespect est devenu le gros streamer que vous connaissez même s'il est plus sur Twitch euh, et ainsi de suite en gros Nightshot a créé 100 Thieves c'est tout ce genre de choses des gens qui étaient là en 2010 avec qui ils ont collaboré qui ont vu les choses arriver avant c'est ça et en fait donc il disait que parfois être visionnaire bah, même si ça prend du temps il faut quand même persister donc c'est euh, là qu'il a eu son petit discours de motivation qui disait mais si vous faites quelque chose en ce moment qui ne marche pas bah, continuez parce que ça peut, ça, peut toujours, ça peut toujours marcher à un moment donné et du coup il racontait que même lui à un moment il a pensé à, à, à partir de, de Optic c'était pendant Black Ops 1 c'est ça si exact. je ne dis pas de bêtises pour faire des documentaires sur le graffiti Sauf qu'au final, il a persisté et il a continué. Et s'il en, en est là où il en est aujourd'hui, c'est parce qu'il n'a pas démissionné. Justement. Il a dit les gens veulent des résultats très rapides. Rapid results, that's mm -hmm. what people want. Mais ce n'est pas exactement ce que vous allez obtenir quand vous vous lancez dans un truc, surtout si ça ne marche pas au début. Ce n'est pas parce que ça ne marche pas au début que ça ne va pas marcher au long terme. Des fois, les choses ont besoin de temps pour se faire. Et il a dit, par exemple, Optic a eu besoin de 14 ans pour arriver à devenir ce que c'est à l'heure actuelle. Donc, c'était vraiment a really good speech. Optic Gotaga, too. At, at one point, did you know that he was an Optic What? Gotaga, yeah. Gotaga was in Optic? Opt uh, yeah, Optic Gotaga. <laughs> look no. it up. Yeah, look it up. It's it's uh, it's on YouTube. Really? Absolutely. Yeah, I didn't know. Yeah. yeah. What? I yeah. missed it. Gotaga is one of my friends. I yeah. know Optic yeah. for Ask him. Ask him. He was, he was, uh, he was uh, obviously very talented, as you know. And, you know, obviously he became who he became. But at the time, uh, you know, and, and I'm actually glad that some of these relationships sort of went their own separate ways because I don't think that... That, that, that people can, can, you know, these sort of people can spread their wings mm -hmm. uh, and truly explore and, and become who they can become if they're sort of in a, in, in, on a team like Optic because of how big it is, right? Like the, the opportunity is definitely there and some people have had that sort of impact, but, you know, some people just have to follow their own path and, and, and go their separate ways. Just a question because when you say it shocked the chat. Yeah. <laughs> How Gotaga was in Optic? How did, did it came that he? So at, at the time we bigger. had so we had Optic PS3 because you know we're you know when we, once we started to expand we had Optic PS3, Optic Girls, Optic Europe, okay. and in Europe we had uh, uh, this guy named Matadors who was friends with Gotaga at the time. Yeah, do you remember Matadors? Yes, yeah, yes, so yes. so shout out to him. Um, and then that's that's how that thing. It, it didn't. It, I don't think it lasted more than a couple of months, but it was a thing, and it did happen. Um, and as you know, obviously, he went on to be a competitive a competitive player, and and, and obviously super successful now. Uh, but you know, very early on, again, the the the, the beauty about optic is that there's something magical about it that sort of gives. I don't know. It's something special. But I, I, it's my favorite thing in the world. 
in the, in the heart. Les gars, on vient d'apprendre que Gotaga était chez Optic à l'époque. Je ne le savais même pas et c'est vraiment putain de passionnant. C'est un truc de ouf, vraiment. C'est, c'est la folie. Um, when, uh, like, when Modern Warfare 2 was released, it was uh, when the sniping era as well as the domination of Call of Duty uh, came, like with that game. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us more, like, about your debut on it? So it's one of the, your first video, obviously. And uh, the evolution of Optic Gaming on Modern Warfare 2. I, I think, like, uh, about uh, things like video editing, the Optic Predator, the big montage mm. and stuff. Beautiful. Can you speak to us about it? I think most people started to know Optic at that time. Yeah, it, it was, you know, by then Optic had already sort of established itself as a, as, as a new thing. And it's like a thing that happens and something that's replicable, something that other people can be inspired by and, and go there. And w- what I will say is that every person that, that has come and buy by Optic You know, that opportunity and, and what they became is all on them. It has nothing to do with Optic. It has nothing to do with me. They are the ones that put all of the effort to become who they became. Yes. Uh, I can open doors all day, but it's up to the individual to walk through it and own the room. Okay. So just think about the amount of people that have come through Optic. Like not everybody has has had the opportunity to become as big or not as, as successful, right? So it's certain individuals that see the opportunity and then they put in the work. It has, it has nothing to do with Optic. It has not, nothing to do with us. It literally is up to the individual and their hard work as they put forward. Predators? Yeah. One of my favorites. It was same. Yes. Goosebumps when I saw yeah, them back. <laughs> it, it was it was so good. It was such a good time too because it was all about creativity. It wasn't until people started to be like, okay, four men on screen and it's a good clip. That to me was one of the one of I, I didn't I didn't agree with it personally because okay. the shot is all that matters. The composition of the shots and 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 the and, and all that is what matters. The the letters on the side of you being quick enough to kill four people or four headshots on a row. It, there, there's something to it, but I think that people got so caught up in doing that that they forgot about the beauty of just getting cool shots and creating a beautiful composition yes. video around it. Do, do, do you think <laughs> it's might it was uh, like what you said is was the time like uh, you were maybe. Uh, I, I wouldn't say like old because we were very old at the time, but there was like a gap between the younger people oh, yeah. who loved and that yeah. and you was like a more artist, calm, collected stuff while they were like, okay, phone screen, quick scopes, the no yeah. scope, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I, I, again, for me, th- if you think about it, I started this thing when I was like, I went into optic when I was 29 years old. I was, I was already a father while everybody else was barely like 19, 18. And, you know, uh, I kept getting older and so did my friends. But as I kept getting older, the, the, the people that were upcoming kept getting, getting younger and younger. Like to, to this day, I'm 42. Shotzi is 21 years old. <laughs> uh, Dashi is 21 years old. You know what I mean? These are young people, like 20 year difference. Right. So it's, it's, uh, It has, it's some, it has something to do, obviously, with the longevity of Optic and, the, and, and our ability to continue to innovate as we go along our, our, our path and, you know, creating history as we go along. And I think that's very important for everybody that, that, that does what we do. We are part of history right now. We may not understand it and we may see it as something that, that we are all doing just for fun. But if you, if you take a step back and look at it from a, from a, from a high level... You realize that this is so young that you are making history. France, in, in, in 20 years from now, 30 years from now, this is going to be taught in colleges. And when, they, when those students who are not born yet do the research, they're going to find this podcast 20 years from now. And they're going to be like, oh, Zach was one of the innovators of the space or one of the people that, that, that built what we get to take advantage of today. <laughs> You know, like, I'm going to be honest with you, and I think that's what most of the chat uh, thinks as well. Your speeches are really, really motivational. I, I like them. Like, I feel what you say. We feel what you say. Thank Est-ce you. que vous ressentez ce qu'il dit pour même pour ceux qui comprennent l'anglais? C'est magnifique. It's really beautiful. And I really hope, like, that maybe in uh, 10 days, uh, some people will uh, look back, see uh, Zach and Ronib with Hector and say, okay, so 10 years ago, it was yep. like this. That's what they were thinking. Yeah, as, as surprised as you were to see Ali A on there or every other person that has been here, 
very early on, I understood what we were building. And it is something that I tell the players and the creators today, especially the professional players who who are sort of building Call of Duty esports as they go along. They are not the ones that are going to benefit from this. There will be one day where there is a $5 million contract a year mm. that is given to a professional player. But we need to build this thing now in order for that to happen. And that's the unfortunate thing about the sacrifices that we're doing in this day and age, because we aren't going to be... or the majority of the people that are building this thing are not going to be the ones that benefit from what we built. But there's something to be said about the beauty of planting a tree that you may not benefit the shadow of in the, in the future. Right. So. Magnifique. Alice, je te laisse retranscrire pour les non-English speakers parce que là, c'était magnifique. Ouais, donc euh, tu parlais de Modern Warfare 2 et il disait qu'à cette époque-là, Optic, c'était déjà, ils étaient déjà imposés, ils étaient déjà assez vraiment populaires euh, dans le dans le milieu. Ouais. Et il a dit quelque chose de très très juste. Il disait, mais en fait, toutes les personnes qui sont passées chez chez Optic, c'était par leur individualité et leur réussite personnelle qui réussissent maintenant dans la vie. Il a dit, moi, j'étais là que pour ouvrir les portes. C'était à eux de décider s'ils voulaient y passer ou non, quoi. Et, et mettre le donc, travail dedans. Il a dit, c'est. Uh, uh, we are speaking about the door example that you said, like the door phrase, like you can open the door, then it's your uh, job to go in there and yeah. uh, make it work like il a dit moi j'ouvre la porte avec optique tout le monde n'a pas réussi parce que moi j'ouvre la porte c'est à toi maintenant de rentrer dans la pièce et de t'approprier les lieux en gros faire le travail pour faire en sorte que ça fonctionne c'est pour ça que pour certains en sortant d'optique ça fonctionnait pour d'autres un peu moins Exactement, et après quand tu lui as montré Predator du coup il disait que c'était vraiment la belle époque avec beaucoup de créativité et en fait avec du recul, donc il dit ça maintenant mais au départ lui il n'était pas hyper emballé par, par l'idée et il pense que c'était principalement à cause de la différence d'âge ouais. parce que bah, lui il avait déjà 29 ans, il était déjà père et tout et tous les jeunes qui débarquaient chez Optic bah, ils étaient à peine majeurs, ils avaient entre 18 et 20 ans donc il s'est dit bah c'est peut-être à cause de ça que moi j'étais pas trop emballé euh, à l'époque quoi. Genre les jeunes ils... young people, les jeunes ils aimaient bien les quickscopes, les foreign screens les headshots and stuff et lui il était encore déjà dans le petit tu sais le shot bien beau bien précis bien édité bien fait etc et c'était 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 vraiment mignon est-ce que t'as encore quelque chose Alice ou c'est good ouais bien sûr après du coup il racontait que lui il avait déjà senti qu'à partir dès même 2009 avec Youtube tout de suite il avait compris qu'il y avait un truc à faire il y avait un truc à explorer dans, dans ce domaine et qu'il fallait pousser à fond parce que il le savait, tu vois, il était un peu précurseur, il avait ce sentiment que derrière, il pouvait y avoir une création d'une énorme communi communauté et tout, et que c'est comme ça qu'ils allaient réussir. Et après, il a dit, euh, bah, ça se trouve, dans, dans, 20 ans, dans 20 ans, là, les gens, ils vont aller regarder le Zach en roue libre et ils vont dire, ah ouais, ils, avaient, ils vont avoir besoin de l'étudier, ils vont ça. se dire, putain, euh, Zach, c'était le précurseur de tout ça et tout, tu vois. La folie. Et, et voilà, donc il disait, on le voit peut-être pas, mais nous, on est en train d'écrire l'histoire là maintenant. Et euh, il racontait que, bah, en étant précurseur, en général, on bénéficie pas des fruits de ce qu'on crée, mais que du coup, il faut penser bah, aux générations qui, qui arrivent. Exactement, magnifique. Uh, we spoke a little bit about Modern Warfare 2. Do, do you want to add anything about Modern Warfare 2? Uh, just about the game or the era or stuff? Or can we go ahead? It's yeah, okay. no, I, th I think so. This is this is also a, a good bit of of, uh, of just like a mentality around it. During Modern Warfare 2, that's when Phase came along, and I had the opportunity to just bring them onto Optic and and do that. And had I done that, I don't think that we would be as good as we are today. Okay. Because I, I, I do believe that although it would have been advantageous for Optic to have what will, what is now phase under it, I, I, I do believe that because of the innovation that they brought to the space, because I was comfortable at the time, we we're number one, no one can touch us. But here comes phase with the young approach, with the young sort of new mentality yes. of creating trick shots and all that. And although that wasn't my thing, I was all about competition and winning. I do believe that because of the new mentality and the new approach that they had, they sort of pushed the space forward. And by doing so, it made me work harder because had, and, and also like there's something to be, if, if I would have taken the easy approach of sort of soaking them up, because at the time optic was optic and phase was just starting, it would have been really easy for me to be like, yo, fuck that shit, join us. Um, But I, I didn't realize then what I know now is the fact that if if I would have done that, I wouldn't have been as good as I am today because I needed that that level of, of competition for me to elevate and try harder to be and continue to stay above water. You, you thought about, uh, uh, about it at, this, at the time? Like to take over phase or just soak the... No, I just, it, it never happened, but I, I did I did think about it. I'm like, and there's a video out there where it says, I'm like, they're going to be my, my future sniping team. Um, I, I'll show you, I'll, I'll link you the video, but it's 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 there. It's on the internet. You can, you can find it. Um, But again, you know, at the time I didn't know it, but now I know that if they wouldn't have come along, I wouldn't have, I would have just been this, you know, fat, comfortable, everything's yeah. good guy. Competition 
as frustrating as it sometimes is, it also elevates your position because if you are a competitive person, someone doing something better than you is only going to make you try harder and try to outdo them. And that's how the space gets pushed forward. Ce qu'il disait, c'est qu'à l'époque, ils auraient pu aspirer FaZe au moment où FaZe commençait à être un tout petit peu bon. Et du coup, tu vois, être les gros premiers comme ça, tu vois, genre, we are the number one and stuff. Mais sauf que à l'époque, ils ne l'ont pas fait, ils ne l'ont pas fait, même s'il y avait une vidéo, il a rigolé en disant, c'est ma future équipe de snipers. FaZe s'est développé, a explosé et a été un gros compétiteur. Ce qu'ils ont, ce qu'ils ont forcé, en gros, à beaucoup travailler pour essayer, du coup, de devenir à nouveau les numéro un, ou en tout cas, tenir la cadence que FaZe imposait à l'époque. Ce qui, au final, a rendu tout le monde meilleur. Et il pense que ça a été une meilleure chose que ça a été comme ça il ne regrette pas de pas avoir pu prendre phase à l'époque pour vous dire donc c'est, c'est assez dingue For, from 2010 uh, I'm, I'm gonna say 2011 um, Optic has invested in esports like by creating a Modern Warfare 2 team at the time with Nature then on Black Ops 1 with the first roster uh, with uh, Merc, Rambo, J-Cap and uh, Big Timer we have a picture on a une photo uh, de ça uh, why was there like this, this, this desire to do uh, esport for a team that was like at the time essentially on YouTube uh, was it like the natural evolution for you So we started in competition. We, we were competitive <coughs> players at first. We stepped away from that, as, as you remember, uh, by my brother saying, let's leave that behind. Let's, let's do this new thing. Um, going back to support Call of Duty was, has always been important to me because I, I do understand that in the future, this is going to become something that, I mean, now we're living it now, right? But at the time it was like, I can see this thing sort of progress into somewhere where a lot of people are going to be interested. So we had 300,000 subscribers on YouTube before, and this is what, 2011, right? So that's a lot of subscribers, right? At the time. So at the time I'm like, okay, if, 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 what more content could we create? What can we, what isn't being displayed? And to me, the natural evolution was like, all right, well, we have all the show off stuff. We have all the fancy sniping montages and gameplays. Well, what does the top of the food chain look like? What do top players who are better than me, And my audience thinks that we're the best. Well, okay. let us show them who the true best is. So that's where that, that sort of mentality came from. I wanted to display um, the, the real best players in the game. And although they weren't sniping, there is obviously something that's entertaining about watching somebody master a craft that you don't have the hands or the hand, you know, gift to do something like that. How did you find them at the time? Like Merc, Rambo, JT, Big T and stuff? So Diesel, uh, Optic Diesel, the guy that created the logo for Optic, who's still my teammate to this day in Old Men of Optic, he's the one that that always kept a, a relationship with the with the gaming with the competitive gaming community because he's him, he's a competitive person. So he's the one that 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 sort of had the conversation with Nate Shot uh, very early on, and and then from there, Nate Shot and Predator became really good friends, and then they started like the Snipers Going Ham series, and you know, little by little, we started to to create. My thought from the beginning was this. I wanted to create a competitive Call of Duty team that would go to MLG events and compete. And I said, me, Hutch, c Nanners, and Tabe. I don't remember Tabe. I'm like, we're going to go there. We're going to get our, our butts beat up because we're not that good. But I can guarantee you that we're going to sell more T-shirts that they, than anybody else there <laughs> because of how big our popularity is and because of the relationship that we had with, with, your community. with our communities. Yeah, The flex. <laughs> flex yeah and and i thought to myself i'm like well that's gonna be really hard to convince you know c nanners who is a very calm and very like peaceful individual and although very good uh, uh you know to this you know he is competitive for sure but is he that level of competitive and is he going to be okay with sort of putting his brand on the line against people who are inevitably going to be way better so my thought was it is going to be a lot easier for me to turn competitive players into personalities than it would be to create personalities out of, out of pro players. Of course. It's way harder to go this way, like the personality to competitive player yeah. while well, the other way is way, way easier. What, what was the impact uh, uh, at the time of winning the first Call of Duty Championship? The first Call of Duty Championship, Modern Warfare 3, uh, took place at the end of Black Ops 1, which was a couple months after you started having the team, uh, which went to the MLG and stuff. It was a team uh, with, uh, I think, a Nate Shot and a lot of other players. What was the impact at the time to was like, The first kind of world champion. Yeah. So I think the impact was was good from a content perspective. My thought is you have to entertain people. 
And if you give them the same old, same old every single day, whether it's the top five plays or uh, a, a sniper doing the same thing that everybody else has been doing, getting a quad, it, like, it, it gets a little bit redundant. So what you want to do or what I thought to myself is like, what else can we give them that is a little bit more uh, outside of, of the box that we have created for ourselves? So although we were very successful already, I was not going to stop there. I wanted to see what came next. And competitive was was what it was. And once we won our first championship and we showed it to our fans, they were like, oh, my God, I got to watch next time because, you know, I love Optic and, you know, the sniper team's best. But this is competition. So let's go support them. And on the first the first uh, the first time that we went uh, and again, this is on the Internet. You can you know, it's luck. The, the good things about the things that I say is that they are all provable things, right? They, they, there's no lying in the Internet. No lies. When I prepared this video, I found one of your first video on Black Ops at the time uh, where uh, like you were making a it was not an ad, but you were speaking to the people about an MLG coming up and you said, OK, they're going to be me. They're going to be uh, this guy, this guy, the Optic Pro team. Just come if you want to compete against the best. If you don't want to compete and just hang out, just come a whole video just to advertise yeah. like an MLG coming up and just make it discover to the people. Yeah. Yeah. We figured, look, we, we, we figured that this was going to be an important part of the business that we were creating that I didn't know was a business. I wanted to, to do that. And on the first event, we, we went from, uh, I, I believe like 150 to 300 people watching to 10,000 people watching. Okay. And what happened there was that Sonny, uh, Sundance Di Giovanni, one of the co-founders yes. of MLG, and immediately said, "What just fucking happened there?" Because Call of Duty had never seen that 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 spike in viewership. And then he said, "Well, why? Like these are these are StarCraft level numbers on Call of Duty. We've never seen that before. What happened there?" And obviously, it was attributed to the fact that I was on my phone and I did a live thing and I put it. I pointed my phone towards Fwiz and Hastro, who were online. And I just uploaded to to YouTube, put a link on it, and everybody that was our followers like clicked on that shit immediately and and went to watch our match. Uh, like you you spoke about uh, uh, like the, we are gonna sell more jerseys. If you have the memory, how many jerseys were sold <laughs> back in the day? Yeah, back in the day uh, at Anaton MLG event. So so it, so it was a theory that that we would sell more T-shirts because jerseys hadn't. That's another thing, right? Jerseys, as you know them today. Like the poor jerseys. <laughs> yeah, well, if you think about it, like everybody was wearing t-shirts, like team shirts. Yes. When we came on the scene, we brought the paintball sort of like jerseys and like the, the team. I was, I was just having a conversation with a friend of mine about the innovative, um, uh, how everything needs to be innovated. So when we first came on the scene with paintball jerseys, it was hype. It was a little bit, it wasn't a soccer jersey and it wasn't a basketball jersey. It was, it was something that we could claim as ours. And then what happened was, you know, years later, Temper and the boys brought out the soccer jerseys, yes. you know, with the tricolor. And I'm like, man, that's so sick. And, and most, the numbers and stuff. Yeah. And most recently, I think that what 100 Thieves did with their rugby sort of, uh, uh, you know, jerseys this last year was one of the coolest thing that's ever happened in the in the world of esports. So, you know, shout out to their their creative team because it it is it is something that you know we 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 haven't really had a, a, the time to focus on innovative stuff because of the business side of Optic and what we've been through for the last you know four years mm -hmm. yeah four years. So it's it's been a little bit of a of a get Optic to a right place instead of you know focusing on innovative and cool stuff that we can do. Magnifique. Alice, je te laisse faire un joli résumé de tout ceci. Ouais, alors il disait qu'à l'époque, bah, Optique, ça marchait déjà super bien, mais qu'en fait, il, 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 donc lui, il savait déjà qu'il y avait un potentiel euh, futur, mais il savait pas... Enfin, il s'est dit, mais du coup, comment moi, je vais pouvoir l'exploiter Et il s'est dit, bah en fait, euh, parce que là, il savait que là, s'il allait en MLG avec une équipe pourrie, et même lui qui jouait, parce qu'ils étaient pas ouf, bah il savait quand même qu'il allait vendre des, des t-shirts. Mais du coup, il s'est dit, s'il faut booster les trucs, comment on pourrait faire Bah, il faut qu'on prenne les meilleurs joueurs. Parce que du coup, lui, ce qui était vraiment important pour lui, c'était du coup le, le contenu, parce qu'il savait qu'avec la communauté qu'ils avaient derrière Optique, ils pouvaient faire littéralement tout ce qu'ils voulaient, il y avait des gens qui les suivaient. Et du coup, il s'est dit, bah, c'est plus simple de transformer un pro player en célébrité que l'inverse. Ouais, qu'une célébrité coup, en pro player, c'est plus ce compliqué, avait. ouais. Ouais, c'est un peu plus compliqué. 
du coup c'est c'est exactement euh, ce qu'ils ont fait et euh, parce qu'en fait du coup euh, les contenus dès qu'ils ont commencé à, à poster un peu euh, sur la compétition les gens sur YouTube ils étaient en mode oh mais euh, la vache je savais pas qu'il y avait ça il faut que j'aille les encourager et tout et du coup ils racontaient que les audiences bah elles ont carrément explosé quoi au départ c'était vraiment genre 2000 personnes et c'est passé à 10 000 c'est ça qu'ils disaient il me semble ouais c'est ça je crois même qu'ils disaient 300 à 10 000 parce que quand Optique est arrivé avec sa grosse fanbase et qu'ils ont commencé à avoir une équipe pro sur Black Ops 1 ça a cho choqué les chiffres MLG tu vois ça faisait des audiences telles que Starcraft 2 à l'époque était le plus gros jeu c'est ça et du coup en fait bah, tout le monde attendait que qu'Optic qu vienne parce que euh, c'était déjà pour euh, pour Call of Duty c'était des chiffres qui étaient euh, impensables au début et là ça, ça avait juste complètement euh, explosé et ils savaient très bien que les événements c'était ce moment là où niveau contenu il allait pouvoir euh, ramener le, le plus de monde possible et après du coup il a parlé des, des maillots parce qu'à l'époque quand il parlait de vendre des t-shirts c'était réellement des t-shirts ouais. c'était pas vraiment les maillots comme nous on les connaît euh, nous maintenant et euh, du coup après bah il disait que bah c'était Face qui avait ramené ce côté un peu genre euh, maillot de foot, <rire> et, maillot tout, de et, foot et que plus récemment il ouais. y avait euh, Andre Thieves qui avait fait des des maillots un peu comme euh, comme au rugby mais qu'à l'époque c'était pas du tout ça donc euh, qu'il était content au niveau créativité que ça ça boum un petit peu quoi que ça explose I have a quick question do, do you know like uh, the the bigger team uh, esports team in France uh, Vitality Vitality yes um... That's it. That's all I know. You only know uh, Vitality? Yeah. It's uh, funny because like we have a, a big team. Uh, I asked the same question to Temper. What's the name? Uh, it's uh, Carmine Corp. KC. The no. tag. It doesn't uh, no. say anything to you? No. Like uh, it's a team. It's normal because they are just starting to develop to have a Rocket League team, a Valorant mm -hmm, team mm -hmm. now and stuff. So they are getting bigger and bigger. They had a League of Legends team as, uh, at first. Yeah. And uh, it's a team uh, like uh, who was uh, uh, made by uh, Kameto, which is a big French streamer and uh, since uh, like two or three years uh, two years I think uh, it, uh, it's really really successful and I think it's the team with the biggest fan base in France and uh, it kind of remind me of the early days of Optic if you want awesome and uh, it's a really really big uh, and it, it's is, good to hear it's uh, there is a really big fan base I think you will hear one day of uh, I hope so it's, it's yeah, true look Vitality was competing against Optic and Gfinity ESWC so that uh, Gotaga was on the right so those those are the sort of Uh, the teams that I remember, uh, if, if you're, if you're not, you know what I mean? Like if, if you're not there, there's, it's pretty hard to do that. But I completely, like, I just found out about loud like two years ago. Right. And loud is massive in, in, in Brazil. Brazil. Yeah. So, uh, I, I believe that same, same way. If you ask, you know, somebody else, like what are the odds that somebody in Brazil or somebody that you know, optic is known only because we've been around from the beginning of time, you know, uh, so. <laughs> the people in the chat, they told me, <laughs> He doesn't remember us while we beat them. We beat Optic in Rocket League. Uh, <laughs> Apparently, yeah. Optic lost to Carmine. Corp. Just, just recently. I, I think maybe recently. <laughs> C'est intéressant, les gars. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's funny because uh, Kamel, uh, have you heard about the Pixel War? The what? The Pixel War, the big community event on Twitch, uh, on Reddit, a couple uh, months ago that made big viewership and stuff. What was it? The the racing stuff? It wasn't a, race, a racing stuff. It was uh, another thing. The pixel war. It was like a, um, there was a board on Reddit where everyone could draw some things. Oh and yes, were big of course. Community. Yeah, yeah, of course. And the French community had a lot of big streamer who did <coughs> like massive things. There was even a Zinedine Zidane portrait uh, on it, and uh, it was like uh, leaded by Kame led by Kameto, which is oh, the awesome. guy I spoke. Uh, uh, I'll, I spoke look, to I'll look you into about. it. Yeah, the Reddit place. I, uh, I, I'm a, I'm a, I learn, right? I'm a, I'm a student of what we're building uh, every single time. So uh, the more I know, the better. So thank you for introducing me to that team. It's fine, it's fine. You, you will hear about them. I'm quite sure uh, one day. Uh, uh, Modern Warfare 3, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, go back to Call of Duty. Uh, Modern Warfare 3 is the first game where a European and American team met. Uh, so beforehand, uh, there was only MLG and competition in Europe, uh, ECLs, EGLs. Mm -hmm. uh, then Optic came to Europe to compete. At first, uh, EGLs. GL5, then GL7, which they won by stomping the tournament. Uh, how was it for you? And was it important for you to cross the Atlantic yeah. to develop that, to see how it was? Uh, how was it for you? It was a dream come true. One, to be able to get to travel to Europe, to do something that you love is like priority number one. Most people don't have the same luxury of being able to travel for work to like these incredible you know, places, legendary places, historical places. So for us to go to Europe and, and, and London and then eventually France, I think for for us, it was, you know, an, an eye opening experience because we knew that we had. So this is Apex, right? The yeah, Apex, Apex team. Yeah, but it was the first event, yeah. EGL5, I just yep, wanted yep. to tell you. Um, so 
so yeah, look, at, at that time we weren't making enough money to be able to fly to them. Actually, to be to be fair, I didn't even get a chance to 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 do that. They said, "Hey, we're going to Europe and this is what's happening." I was like, I was like "All right, I'm not going to hold anybody back." Uh so anyway, they the next time they were with us immediately. They so, came up uh, for yeah, GL7, yeah, so I just Yeah, so keep the Apex in it. No, no, I, no, this is part of history. I I love it, right? It was it was a moment in time. It was real. It happened. Uh but but for me, I knew that we had a lot of people in England specifically that that was that were fans of Optic and they consumed their content and to be able to meet them in person is always like one of the greatest joys of my life. Uh, I'll be walking down the street and I'll make eye contact with somebody who doesn't necessarily know who I am, but I'm like, wait, I know him. And that's a relationship that it was once only one way, me talking to a camera. So when I get to sort of put you know, a face to one of the many people that, that follow us, it's always an, an absolute honor and it reminds me that you know, it, it is it it isn't just the camera that we're talking to. There's something deeper there that, that that's a connection that's real. And was it uh, like important just to go to European events to even win them and say, okay, so we won now the Call of Duty XP and stuff. We even can win in the uh, in Europe and stuff. I I think like there wasn't may, many tournaments in the US at the time. Maybe it was the only way for you to compete. Yeah. But was it important for you to do this? Absolutely. Again competition makes you better and we were going over there to find out whether or not europe was better or na was better but one thing was for sure somebody was going to benefit out of that right if if we lost then we would have known that we have to be better if they lost which they did that elevated their their scene and if you look at it now there's a lot of top players that are in the United States. I mean, you know, the, the Frenchman, uh, uh, Paco Hydra, yeah, like he's, Paco. he's competing, right? So he's competing at a, at a super, super high level. And I believe that there, that, that talent like Paco is everywhere. You can find the same thing in Germany, the same way you can find them in, in France or Belgium, you name it. There's, there's a player out there that is good enough to be able to compete at the level that we're at. Really? Of course. Absolutely. Think about, think about soccer, right? It's, it's the biggest sport in the world or football, right? The biggest sport in the world. Um, they're not from NA, right? There are some NA players that are good enough to compete yes, overseas. So, Alfonso but, Davies, for example, he comes from Canada and yeah. he's in Bayern Munich and he's one of the best at what yeah. he does. Yeah. So, it, you know, the, the, as, as this thing progresses and it gets larger and larger, I foresee a future in which Optic does have a French player or Optic does have a uh, an Egyptian player or, oh. or uh, you know, that th th that is a possibility. It's just undiscovered talent. Right. Maybe somebody watching this is going to be the next biggest influencer in the world or also maybe the best Call of Duty or Rocket League player like you don't know the biggest the biggest um, the biggest crime, in my opinion, is not having the path to pro that we're currently building right now, because I think that there is a lot of opportunity for people who don't have the resources And given the resources, we could see an elevation of the scene as a whole. Magnifique. It, it kind of reminds like uh, the, the training ground that they put in the football clubs where you can just come have like uh, access to great uh, pitch, uh, great material and stuff yeah. and just express like your talent. Yeah. And uh, so you don't miss out because you just don't have the money, you know. It's something that uh, we have in Europe. That's why we produce a lot of football players in yeah. the, for example uh, of this quality and uh, very regularly uh, Alice genre, je te laisse prendre le, euh, le relais sur ça parce que c'était très bien ce qu'il vient de dire Ouais, alors du coup, il parlait de, de ce, que ce que ça avait été les, les voyages en Europe avec euh, tous les tournois qu'ils avaient, qu avaient gagnés. Quand et ils, ils étaient arrivés sur MW3 et qu'ils avaient commencé à gagner tous les tournois en Europe, notamment le GL5, le GL7 et le GL8, par contre, qui avait été pris par TCM à l'époque. Exactement, et du coup, il disait que c'était un truc qui était incroyable parce qu'il n'avait pas du tout imaginé qu'un jour, il pourrait voyager en Europe et visiter euh, genre, euh, genre Londres, euh, Paris et tout euh, pour le travail et que le travail, ça soit bah, justement euh, Call of Duty. Quoi. Il ne le pensait pas forcément. Et euh, du coup, il, il, il disait que c'était vraiment, vraiment génial. Et surtout, quand il était en Angleterre, il a rencontré beaucoup, beaucoup de fans de la communauté. Ça. Et c'est à ce moment-là qu'il s'est aperçu que, bah, en fait, filmer et faire des vidéos, il bah, y avait vraiment... C'était pas juste parler à une caméra, il y avait vraiment des gens derrière et ça avait vraiment un impact tout ce qu'il disait donc euh, il était super content de, de ça et après pour reparler de la compétition il disait que bah, pour lui ça avait vraiment un impact et c'était hyper important parce que du coup ça bénéficierait soit d'un côté ou d'un autre le but c'était de montrer qui était le plus fort entre les NA et l'Europe il a dit bah voilà euh, ils ont perdu nous on a gagné du coup ça. bah ça voulait dire que l'Europe avait juste à s'entraîner plus 
Et euh, après, du coup, il disait que, bah, voilà, par exemple, aux États-Unis, il y avait des joueurs euh, internationaux européens, comme par exemple Hydra. Ouais, pas et cool. que, euh, Exactement. Et que, bah, en fait, justement, euh, peut-être qu'un jour, Optique aura aussi des joueurs euh, français, égyptiens, euh, internationaux qui viennent euh, d'Europe ou quoi que ce soit. Et que, en fait, c'était juste euh, une question de, de dénicher les, les bons talents, quoi. Et que, justement, lui, le truc qui le, qui le rend le, le plus triste, c'est qu'il y a énormément de gens qui, ont, qui sont vraiment hyper talentueux, mais qui n'ont pas les ressources pour. Et le but, c'est d'essayer de créer du coup des choses pour faire en sorte que on ne rate pas le talent juste parce qu'ils n'ont pas les moyens et c'est ce qu'ils essayent de mettre en place. Il y avait Hector dans le chat il y a un instant. Montrez-lui un peu d'amour, montrez-lui un peu de love. C'est important, montrez que vous êtes content qu'on fasse ça, qu que Zachary Olibio essaie et, euh, et lieu et que euh, écoutez d'autres personnes, écoutez d'autres euh, euh, histoires, etc. Ça vous tient à cœur. Je remercie encore une fois d'ailleurs WeWard de nous accompagner pour ça. N'hésitez pas à aller pour les savoir sur WeWard dans le chat. Euh, c'est une application où vous pouvez marcher et gagner de l'argent euh, gratuitement. Donc euh, c'est vraiment grave cool. Uh, they show you some love in the chat. They saw that you were there. They are really happy. And the French community is really, really, uh, has a really big bound with Optic. I think you saw it at uh, the different ESWC and stuff, but we're going to speak about it in a moment. Mm -hmm. Just before, I want to just go back to uh, like Black Ops 2. Uh, at the start of Black Ops 2, Optic uh, took like a, one, I would say uh, at the time, a controversial decision when uh, like you kicked Rambo uh, for Nate Shot. Uh, many thought it was because like uh, of Nate Shot fan base at the time. So just 10 years later, I'm just going to ask, what, why did you do it at the time? Uh, exactly what, what the reason you said, right? His popularity was growing, right? I, I think that the platform we gave him, the door that we opened for him to, to take advantage of, um, and him being live every single day sort of developed and, and, and allowed for his personal growth to be what it was. And at the time... Uh, you, you, you have to understand that business decisions back in those days weren't as easily accepted as they are today. Okay. Because back then it was all about passion. Back then it was all about, you know, doing the things that you do because you love them instead of getting paid by it. And at the time, you know, for me to say, hey, uh, Nate Chad is having conversations with Red Bull and Red Bull would be a really good sponsor for Optic. Whether they brought money or not, it doesn't matter. It's about the relationship that you're building at the time. And, you know, the the only player that at the time could be replaced was 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 Rambo. And, you know, it was a unanimous decision. It wasn't just mine. Um, and, you know, it was the right decision, obviously. Like, if you, if you look at where we're at today, it was definitely the right decision. You know, empowering people who are uh, on the way up is what you have to do every single time. You have to rally behind the popularity of a, of a specific person because, you know, a, a, as a team, your, your job is to build each other up. And the second that that starts to work, you have to hyper-focus on that and be like, what more can we do? So making him, you know, not, not only allowing him to join Optic, right, at the time, but then eventually him being the captain of, of that, you know, allowed for his persona to continue to grow because it, it went from, you know, him being the player that he was and then being the most popular uh, Call of Duty player, but then being the captain of it, like all of these things sort of like added to the machine that is Nate Shot and, and, and the growth and the legend that is that is Nate Shot. So uh, at the time, it was an easy decision to make. You know, Rambo had the same opportunity to stream as long as as, as Matt did. He had the same, he had, everybody in the, on the team had the same resources to be able to do what Nate Shot did. Nate Shot was the only one at the time that just said, I'm, I got to stream, I got to stream. I have to, I have to make content. I, and this is how I connect. Right. So he learned from the predators. He learned from, uh, the, the D treats and the, and, and, and us from, from creating content. And that sort of elevated his, his position on the team to be, you know, one of the most important assets and, 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 and members of It was of also mutual benefits. I would say like, I mean, he was already on the team and he saw the benefit. He saw the opportunity because again, you, you don't just come on optic and, and just make a bunch of money. It's not how it works. You have to put in the work, right? Like it is, it is, and this goes and applies to everything in the world. You have to make it work and you have to put in the work. You have to, you have to work harder than everybody else to win in this thing. And uh, it even worked out at the end because like you won the first event on Black Ops 2. It was a UMG, I think in December, pretty early. But I think that when you won this one, Just after the chain, uh, just after like the, the, the controversy uh, it made, it, it was a good thing. I think in your mind it was like, okay, we were right. Yeah, look, winning at the time didn't matter to me, right? I mean, uh, let me rephrase that. Winning has always mattered, but content has always had a little bit of a leg up on there. Be okay. Because my thought was, if a tree falls in the middle of the forest and nobody's around to see you win a championship, did you win a championship? Right. It's a little bit confusing there because I mixed two things together, but it's 
it, it isn't right to me it was about sharing as much as we could because it was an opportunity that we had up until this point no team in the world and i'm not talking about esports i'm just talking about the cowboys i'm talking about uh, you know real madrid i'm talking about everybody up until that point nobody had the opportunity to take youtube and use it as a tool as yes. an advantage to to grow an audience and to and to have the relationship so we had an advantage there i mean even to this day you see traditional sports companies buying up esports teams as it happened with me why do you think that is it wasn't because they needed i mean i'm sorry it wasn't because it made sense from a business standpoint it made sense from an audience standpoint baseball football uh soccer you name it it's all consumed on, on tvs right but every young audience that was consuming content was right here so they needed to live on the phone and on twitch and on, on youtube and they weren't doing that so very early on i saw that as an opportunity i'm like if if this is going where i think it's going then we need to pay more attention to growing an audience and the way that you grow an audience is by sharing and by 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 meeting people um that that, that truly gets it to to where it's at the days of of that athlete is i'll never be able to shake that athlete's hand that well that was our advantage because we wanted to meet people of course we wanted to be a community we wanted to 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 meet everybody because we knew that more meant bigger and the bigger we went the bigger the opportunity oh, no. it's amazing to you it even helped uh, shed at the time to develop his youtube and stuff and even the optic as a whole it was like from a business standpoint it was just the right thing to do not only that but it helped them right at the time they were just players that played call of duty and sometimes they if they won they got money well i showed them a way to make money whether or not they build uh, or whether or not they won a championship and what i what i realized early on is that if 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 you sort of give your competitive players the ability to only focus on winning and not worry about winning the money to pay the bills a pressure a, a, a pressure gets lifted so at, at, at that moment when you have a career when you have the ability to make money on youtube or other resources your bills are paid your your rent is paid your food is paid and that's out of there winning a tournament is nice but you're solely focused on winning it not because of the money but because you want to win that the money's taken care of you you're, you're now only focusing on winning you're not focusing on anything else not the money not the viewership literally just winning and that's the beauty of it That, that's really beautiful and uh, I really enjoyed it because uh, I can like relate to something Cream uh, uh, said uh, two days ago when he came. He said something like uh, he did like to make content, but uh, to his eyes, uh, in, uh, in Black Ops 2 at least, when you make content plus you're competing, it's a bit hard because like uh, you're not focused solely on one thing, so you end up pretty average at both that's what he said he said even though optic wasn't average at content uh, uh, obviously w do you agree with this or you don't it, really agree what, do you so, think so, like the content part uh, was uh, maybe taking over too much on the competitive side no it, it needed to think about this if optic wouldn't have stepped in and it, they went from 300 people watching to 10,000 people watching okay what what players in this day and age sometimes fail to see is the importance of an audience to a sport some people believe that because they are professional athletes that that's all they need to do it's but where does the enough. money come from to support that you need sponsors you need to be able to create a business that you know the, the money that came into optic 80 of it went out into the players 20 of it was left behind to to the company so that we can buy travel and tickets uh or, or travel and hotel so You know, I, I disagree wholeheartedly. That is the truth that is going to happen 10 years from now. But, but while, while we build this, we need to be building an audience because if there is no audience, there is no sponsors. If there's no sponsors, no there is no payment to be made to these players. So for me, again, I was teaching these guys to make money and not worry about all the, all the other stuff. So yeah, definitely co content took over competition, but it needed to. Because if there was no content, there was no eyeballs, there was no brands that were going to be interested in. Where, 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 the, where the money come from? Where do the price money come from? PlayStation paid. From the viewership. Yeah, from the viewership. So if no one's watching, no one make money. I mean, ask, ask, ask him how he feels about it now, right? Like he's a retired player and he understands now the yes. importance of creating content, right? If he would have followed the program and, and, and he more than anyone being, you know, one of, if not the best player that has ever, you know, played Call of Duty... 
I'm very biased, obviously, Scump being being my my uh, still my teammate, but also somebody that that I've that I you know share like you know we're family, right? Um, this thing is is available to anyone. The, what we did, we didn't do in secret. We showed everybody. Yes, everybody saw the blueprint, and it works. So for players to not take advantage of the opportunity that's there is still to this day one of the most mind blowing things. Why wait until you retire to build an audience? That's going to be the toughest time to do it because you don't have the steady paycheck coming in from your from your team right if you're a professional player and you're getting paid whatever you get paid a month after practice go build your stuff because that money may not be there forever you have to retire at some point and you got to have a nest egg you have to have an opportunity what's your backup plan it, so. it, it reminds me in france uh, we had like uh, something uh, that looks like this but it, it remind, uh, reminded me of the players who played with gotaga Uh, and Vitality mm -hmm. uh, took massive audience because of it, but didn't work on their personal branding at the yeah. time. So they were not streaming or not really, they were not really making content yeah. and stuff. And uh, it ended up when they finished their career or stopped playing in Vitality or with Gotaga. Yeah. Uh, they, 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 it was at this time they started to try and do something, but for a lot of them, it didn't work out really. Yeah, and, and look, the easiest time to be able to create content with somebody who's big is when you're their teammate, right? Period. And the second that you stop being their teammate, they're sort of like, well, I have to build my other teammates up to become what, what they want to become. You know, I, 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 Illy, Illy, for example, right? Like he, he just had a thumb injury, mm -hmm. right? Imagine if that went completely sideways. You know, that's, that's career over. That's no more paycheck from gaming unless you become an analyst, right? Mm. But you know that th this this opportunity is there for everyone, and not everybody is taking advantage of that opportunity. If me at 42 years old, still to this day, am uploading videos and still doing the business side yes. of this thing, there is no excuse as to somebody else, you know, not doing that. You can say that it's different practicing and and getting your head bashed in on a daily basis on a competitive level is is strenuous work. It is. But that's, you know, that's that's the work that you have to put in in order to to create a safety net for yourself. Because, again, all the contracts that are coming are not going to be here for another 10 to 15 years. For now, we have to be okay with the fact that everything that we build today, somebody else is going to benefit from. But you do have the ability to take some cash off the table right now if you do that. Waiting until retirement is the worst thing that you can do because so much pressure, so much financial pressure is going to be put into your content that you're not going to have fun creating no, content. You're going to have pressure and it won't be good. Là, on est en train de parler, les amis, de toutes les personnes. Donc, on a parlé de Black Ops 2. Alice va vous résumer ça. Mais on parlait de toutes les personnes qui, en tenant en joueur pro, etc., n'ont pas saisi l'occasion pour réussir à faire un peu de personal branding, se monter une marque, avoir une vraie fanbase, faire du contenu, du stream, des vidéos. Et donc, du coup, c'est souvent des personnes qui essaient de le faire après leur carrière et qui, du coup, bah, après, ça ne marchait plus trop parce qu'ils avaient la pression à ce moment-là de payer leurs factures et de réussir à gagner de l'argent, ce qui les empêchait. Et, en gros, c'est des personnes qui n'ont pas saisi l'opportunité quand ils les avaient. Et j'ai donné l'exemple de toutes les personnes qui avaient joué avec Gotaga à l'époque euh, et qui n'ont pas réussi à saisir le moment où ils jouaient avec Gotaga et Vitality pour réussir à créer une carrière, à faire quelque chose et après, derrière, pouvoir euh, avoir quelque chose qui tient dans le temps, tout simplement. Et en gros, il appuyait sur le fait à quel point c'était important pour lui, pour les joueurs à l'époque, de réussir à faire du contenu. Et c'est quelque chose qui les a appuyés dans le fait de prendre Nate Shot. Pour ceux qui s'en rappellent sur Black Ops 2, ils avaient pris Nate Shot au début du jeu pour Rambo. Et en gros, pour lui, il disait c'était une décision de business qui était logique parce que Nate Shot avait une grosse fanbase et que ça avait aidé Optic et la scène Call of Duty au total parce que qui paye les factures, qui paye le sponsor, euh, qui paye tu vois les événements, qui paye les cash prizes, qui paye les salaires, c'est les sponsors. 80% des sous que Optic générait, ça allait aux joueurs et 20% payait le reste, les avions, les hôtels, etc. Pareil pour les MLG, les events, les cash prizes, tout ça venait des sponsors, sauf que pour qu'il y ait du sponsor, fallait du viewership et pour qu'il y ait du viewership, fallait faire quelques décisions compliquées, notamment le fait de prendre des shot à l'époque. Sachant qu'en plus, ça leur avait permis de gagner le, le premier event. Alors, je suis désolé, Ali, je t'ai grillé la chic sur celle-là, mais j'ai envoyé euh, naturellement. Il n'y a pas de souci. Il n'y a pas de souci. Tu, 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 ce n'est pas contre toi. Tu m'excuseras. I, I, I went on and I, I pretty much uh, summarized what you said. And Thank you. It's really, it's really <laughs> nice. Even though some players maybe just don't want to make content, I think that most of the time when they didn't want to, it's maybe not because they didn't want, but because maybe they didn't understand why it was important to do so. Yeah, look, I, I, think about, think about uh, Paco, for example, right? Think about the opportunity for a French man to create content in French for an audience that doesn't have, he's in the best spot possible. He's the only one 
from France living the life that that everyone is, you know, sort of, you know, living here in the in the United States. And the other thing that, that, that people need to take into account is that when I advise players to create content, to become bigger, to not need optic, I'm literally creating a competitor or I am creating a a I'm creating a situation in which. I have to pay them more. Yes. Because they're they're bigger. They're valuable now. They're more valuable now. So now I have to sort of I'm 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 negotiating against myself in trying to help them to be more valuable. So it, the, you know, when when I say that, I can see why people would say, "Well, you know, you benefit from that." I'm like, "Yeah, but you benefit more." Right, because I don't get any of your money when when DoorDash or whoever is sponsoring you, I don't get any of that. When you become and have a million a million followers, I have to pay more because, because you're, you're more worth more. Available. So I don't benefit. I mean, I benefit at some point. It's a symbiotic relationship, but I am literally creating people who are going to negotiate or I might have to pay more for. And from a business perspective, that's not good. But again, we're not we're not working in the now. You know, I, I'm trying to work in 15, 10, you know, from, uh, you know, long ways from now. So, you know, it's, it's always been a little bit of a, of a situation where I just don't understand how how people don't take advantage of the of the fact that I'm I'm sort of telling them make me pay more for you, right? Because you can benefit in the immediate. Put where... me in this situation. Yeah. <laughs> Alice, celui-là, je te le laisse. Alors ouais, en fait, il revient un peu bah, sur le, le contenu. Donc euh, toujours, lui, il comprenait pas comment euh, les joueurs ne voulaient pas forcément euh, se mettre à faire du contenu. Et comme tu disais, attendez à la retraite potentiellement, euh, alors que ça engendrait que des problèmes d'argent. Euh, parce que du coup, euh, je reprends un petit peu ce qu'il disait avant aussi. Euh, lui, dans, dans les équipes, pour lui, le, le contenu, c'était hyper important parce que au final, les joueurs, ils formaient aussi leur propre communauté. Et comme ça, bah, à la retraite, ils, ils avaient pas de, de soucis financiers. Et surtout, ça leur permettait d'avoir le, le poids euh, qui s'enlevait du fait que peut-être ils pourraient pas gagner d'argent s'ils gagnaient pas des matchs. Comme ils avaient le contenu et qu'ils gagnaient quand même leur vie, ils pouvaient se focaliser sur la compétition à 100% et au final, qui gagne ou qui perde, c'était pas forcément l'important. Au moins, ils avaient un loyer euh, à la fin du mois. C'est ça. Euh, et après, du coup, bah, il, il, il a répété, il dit, mais en fait, moi, le contenu, ça me bénéficie pas forcément à moi, c'est plutôt aux joueurs que ça leur apporte quelque chose parce qu'au final ça finit par faire monter le prix du joueur en lui-même c'est ça si il disait moi je me crée un compétiteur c'est à dire que le joueur je l'encourage à faire du contenu mais quand il va faire du contenu à avoir une plus grosse fanbase il va venir négocier un meilleur salaire auprès de moi donc en soi je me mets dans une situation plus compliquée mais il dit qu'en gros il vise pour le plus long terme en fait Exactement, lui il pense pas sur le moment, il pense plutôt pour, euh, pour l'avenir parce qu'il disait bah, en fait tous les followers que les joueurs vont avoir, tous les partenariats, les sponsors qui seront juste pour les joueurs, lui il touche rien là-dessus donc au final c'est pas forcément un avantage mais lui il pense surtout à l'évolution du joueur qu'il a maintenant dans son équipe et c'est ce qui est le plus important pour lui. Exactly. The, the beginnings of uh, Call of Duty Kills was, were a little bit like uh, complicated with bad results for uh, the team and the quick departure return of Scamp. We, we, mm -hmm. we remember about it. Despite everything, after a couple months, like you came back by finishing third at Champ and then won the X Game medals mm -hmm. with the arrival of Clayster and Profi. Yep. Can you talk to us through that time? Yeah. Look, it was it was a tough time. Uh, I think it was, we we still to this day call it the dark ages of of, of Optic because you know Scamp was obviously going to be who he is, right? It was obvious to me, um, you know, his, his, uh, his ability to grow his, his, his brand at the time where nature was growing his brand and the competition that they had between each other, it got toxic sometimes, but I, I believe in competition. I, and, and, you know, I sort of like let them be them. Right. Okay. Um, the other thing is, is like, I'm, I'm from the nineties and before the internet, you know, people talk things out and words matter right now. Words don't matter. You can, you can say bad things about everybody all day long because there's no repercussions where I'm from the time that I'm from. If you said something bad, there is a repercussion. The, 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 yeah. There's some atonement that needs to come. So, you know, the, I think, I think that, that, Scump leaving at the time where he was, you know, just as as popular or as as Nate shot, sort of, you know, put a put a little bit. And look, I, I love the kid, right? Like, I, 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 everybody that I that I've ever had on my team has my loyalty for the rest of time, period. You know, because uh, I I take optic very seriously. I take it as a club. I take it as a as a family. And no matter no matter the case, no matter how the departure was, like I always make it a point to have a good exit or a, a good separation with 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 uh, with the people that that I'm teammates with. Um, so when he left, uh, it was a little bit it was a little bit rough uh, because we're building something and it's working. So for you to go somewhere else because you don't like Nate shot. 
is is a problem. And when you make me pick between you and Nate Shot, it's unfair to me because you're the ones you're the one that wants to leave. And over here, I'm talking to Nate Shot, and Nate Shot says, "No, let him stay because he's better. I'll go." No, it's a you, tough decision. Lo- yeah, I mean, it was an easy one because Nate Shot was telling me I'm loyal, and this guy is telling me he's not. Now, at the time, Scump was super young, and who at that time understands the gravity of 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 being, you know, uh, an adult about things? So, uh, you know, the, sure enough, the the viewership for for Scump went down when he went to Envy, and you know, we continued to be who we were. In fact, the the people that replaced him sort of started to take his spot into that. And at the time, obviously, Scump still developing the the his brand, and being as young as he was, people make mistakes. I make mis- I Don't get me started on how many I've made. I'm 42 <laughs> years old, so you can imagine. Um, so, I made quite a lot of mistakes yeah. too. <laughs> so so uh, it was it was a little bit of a sad time, but him coming back and, and Nate Shot having the maturity that he did, uh, you know, people people don't give Nate Shot enough credit for how good of a leader he is because he was mature enough to say, although you stabbed us in the back, you know, not not as, as cruel as I made it sound, but although you, you left us, we know that you're better for the team. And I know that that whatever disagreements we had, we can make work. And I left it up to Nate Chad. I said, it's your decision only because- Your call. Yeah, it's your call. And he was mature enough to 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 bring him back. And, you know, they went on to win a whole bunch of games. Yeah, yeah. And when, you even added, like, as I said, Clayster, Profi and stuff. It really brings something really cool to the team. Clayster coming, obviously, from, like, the, the team caliber team and at the time and stuff- uh, Like, I was happy to see uh, Optic winning again after, uh, like, uh, the big domination from Complexity and uh, Evil Geniuses at the time. Yeah. It was really nice. It was. It was a good time. Competition was all-time high, and we were the underdogs, but we were also the most popular underdogs. That match is made in heaven, you know? You can be the most popular team, and if you win constantly, meh, right? Who cares? You won again. Wow. Adversity... That's what creates a good storyline. And that's what I, I've always been about storylines. I've always been about what do I want to show the fans? And luckily for us, the situations of life happen. And since it's competition, there's always going to be drama. There's personality. So there's always going to be drama. So the excitement of what we were building was sort of like laid out for us. And all we had to do was move things around to present them in a little bit better fashion. And we did. Magnifique. Je lui parlais de l'époque Call of Duty Ghost et il me racontait qu'au début du jeu, Scump avait quitté parce qu'il y avait une rivalité avec Nate Shot, il s'aimait plus trop, les deux réussissaient dans les contenus, mais voilà. Et après derrière Nate Shot, lui, il était ok pour rester, il était même ok pour que lui parte et Scump reste, parce que Scump, il a dit à X, c'est soit, soit moi, soit Nate Shot. Scump est parti, il est allé chez Envious, et c'est là où Scump, il a vu ses viewers baisser, etc., pendant que Optic continue à monter. Et à la fin, bah, ils ont réintégré Scump et c'est Hector qui a dit à, à Nate Shot, Your call, c'est toi qui décide. Est-ce que tu es OK pour qu'on reprenne euh, Scump malgré le fait qu'il ait quitté et qu'il ait mis cette sorte d'ultimatum Et Nate Shot a dit OK, on le reprend. Scump est revenu, ils ont pris euh, Clayster et Profi. Et à ce moment-là, ils ont commencé à gagner, comme j'ai dit, les X Games, faire troisième au Call of Duty Championship et stuff. Euh, réussir à prendre des trucs à l'époque de domination des villes Genesis et Complexity, c'était énorme. Et à créer une sorte de storyline, une big rivalité. La rivalité, je vois quelqu'un l'a dit dans le chat, Clayster, Cream Six, at the time, à l'époque, c'était quelque chose qui était fort. Et c'était vraiment la folie. Et Optic, ça leur permettait de de regagner et de créer des storylines et les storylines on sait avec les américains à quel point c'est vraiment très très important um, Optic won again and uh, uh, there was like some kind of I would say a golden era from 2015 to 2017 with uh, the birth of uh, maybe the most iconic roster uh, in the history of Call of Duty I, I, I think most people here uh, remember them Cream Six Scum Karma Informal uh, many victories in tournaments that culminate in a victory at Champs on uh, Infinite Warfare in 2017 at the time the organization all also changed with the Halo roster, the, uh, the arrival of CSGO, the content side, uh, side that was like totally working, especially with the house you had. At that time, as CEO, how would you describe uh, this golden era that looked good in terms of expansion? Uh, it was it was a golden era, right? It was uh, exactly the pinnacle where we wanted to be. Um, in, in 2017 specifically, that's when the investment opportunity started to come about. I knew that Activision was going to demand a price for being able to join their league. Okay. And although Optic was very happy, profitable, more importantly, uh, which meant that we can keep the lights on and keep everything the same, 
I knew that I needed to be a part of this league. I knew that we needed to continue the competition of this thing. So I knew to, I needed to do that. So the fact that we were that we were champions in in Halo, we were champions in in uh, in Gears of War, we were champions in in Counter Strike, we were champions in Call of Duty. Obviously, the most iconic roster ever. Like it, it, it sort of put us in a position. Not not only that, but obviously we were a profitable company, which no other company out there, yes. uh, you know, was. I mean, th there's a few, right? Uh, well, at the time there was literally maybe one, and those like face clan okay and, you know at, at, at the time um i don't know anybody's financial so I, I i can't speak to it but i just looking being an expert in the scene i can tell you who is and who isn't making money period every single time so um i i think that you know as, as we went through through the years we became more of a, a of one of the most exciting acquisitions that every and that anybody who was investing in esports wanted to be a part of um so yeah it was it was a beautiful time Winning and being wanted by everyone. And uh, what was the strategy when you started to pick other games? Like, I know you already had the, the Halo roster, for example, but when you started to go on, uh, as I said, like uh, Gears of War, Rocket League, uh, maybe uh, even uh, CSGO and stuff, was it important for you to have more and more games, rosters and stuff and be more than just a simple Call of Duty team? So two things. One... I would have been happy with just being a Call of Duty team because we have enough of an impact on a viewership perspective where we can, like if you, look, I don't want to talk bad about other teams, but just with one Call of Duty team, well, Huntsman, for example, Huntsman, when we started that, mm -hmm. we were in the top 10 most talked about teams in, in uh, on Twitter. So if you, if you understand the impact of creating a brand new brand and still being in the top 10 most talked about, think about the hundreds of, 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 Esports organizations mm -hmm. that spend money on League of Legends, spend money on Counter Strike teams, on Gears of War team, and they had them all, and they're still getting their asses beat. Yeah, you know they're still getting they're, they're still there's an impact there. So, you know the 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 strategy about expanding into other teams was more about understanding the importance of garnering a new audience or getting more audience, uh, and, and that came from experience, right? That came from us being a Call of Duty team, somebody from Activision. Uh, JD2020 is his name. Uh, he told me that Optic was only big because of Call of Duty. He said, without Call of Duty, you are not big and you would not exist. And Someone I said, from Activision told you at that? At the time, yeah. JD2020 is his name. Uh, it's cool now. It's, it's, you know, he's lo lo long gone. It doesn't matter. Um, but he said that and I said, okay, watch this. <laughs> That's when we started playing Minecraft. Okay. Okay. When we started playing Minecraft, we got really lucky to have a friendship with uh, Pro Syndicate, and we were streaming. Optic was streaming. You know, it was me, Big Timer, Nate Chad. We're streaming uh, Minecraft in the mornings, and that became such a weird thing for Call of Duty players to be. And Minecraft is Minecraft that it attracted Tom to say, "Hey, let's create a, a series together." Uh, I think to this day, it's still the most popular series he's ever created is Hunting Optic, and it created one of the most iconic pieces of content on the on, on the gaming internet up until this day, just because of what it allowed us to do. So, one, uh, we we grew from there. We elevated. We transcended Call of Duty. Right, we transcended Call of Duty. We weren't just a Call of Duty team. We we're creators. We were gaming creators. We didn't. We were what we were when we started. Right, we we're gaming creators that just happened to use Call of Duty as the platform. Uh, but when I got told that, I said, you know, my ego said, okay, let's see, let's see if it's true because I want to know if it's true. Because if it's true, I need to change that. So when we started playing Minecraft, we knew that it wasn't a fluke. We knew that the people were there for us. So he's wrong. He you sent him a message. No. <laughs> Not important. You know what I mean? I thought you would have. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I, I'm petty, but not that petty. Uh, and he knows, right? I, 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 you know, a couple of years, obviously. And then from that, I realized that, well, are we only gaming creators? Are we only popular because of gaming? So that's when the house happened. And that's when personal videos about trivia, about eating candy, about anything. Then we're like, the okay. challenges and yeah, stuff. So we're like, let's transcend gaming. So we transcend the Call of Duty with Minecraft. Then we transcended gaming with, with the personality-driven content that, 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 that we created. Uh, if you look at my personal channel, there is no gaming content on there for no. the last five years. It's all my person. And that is because of, of that. So shout out to JD2020 for proving me right. And you even know? in the chat, they speak about it, the 60-50. 60-50 Russell Drive. <laughs> you have it somewhere. <laughs> right here. 6050. South 6050. It's the address of the house where you uh, where you made content. Yeah, 6050 Russell Drive in Hoffman Estates, Illinois. Funny anecdote there. 
um, when Nadeshot left and started 100 Thieves years later, the the compound, the 100 Thieves compound, the address is 6050. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's got that tattoo on his on his Beautiful. knuckles. You also have a good tattoo. Can you show it to the camera? Maybe. Regardez les amis, il a un super tatouage. Uh, Est-ce que vous pouvez reconnaître? Can you? Uh, I asked them if they can if they could recognize what was the sniper on it. Yeah, I can. Yeah, it's uh, oh, it's the M40. Yeah, M48. It's the one that changed my life. Ah, the good old M40. M40. Oh, I know, there are OGs in the chats. There are OGs in the chat. Some some people said uh, the intervention, maybe, but no, 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 no. It's the... No, so I got this this tattoo at the same time that Temper got the uh, the intervention on his. Ah, sick. Yeah. Sick, sick. I love the... Uh, We're in Miami. I love... You the, saw it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love the, the American people. You you have this mind for these things. The minds for these things. Thank thing. you. In Europe, we don't have this that much, I think. Est-ce que, Alice, tu peux nous traduire tout ce qu'il vient de dire sur toute la maison, tout ça, machin, c'est la folie. Exactement, donc il disait que bah, 2015-2017 c'était vraiment bah, la période d'or, l'âge d'or un peu pour, pour Optique et que c'était là que ça marchait hyper bien, ils étaient hyper rentables et euh, en fait il y a un mec d'Activision qui est venu lui dire, Écoute, en ce fait, il a dit, hein. euh, franchement euh, Optique euh, vous fonctionnez uniquement, enfin ça marche uniquement parce qu'il y a Call of Duty et du coup lui comme c'est un compétiteur et qu'il a quand même un peu d'ego, il s'est dit ok on va tester et du coup, ils sont lancés sur sur Minecraft. Ils ont fait toute une série euh, qui est dispo sur YouTube ouais. où euh, du coup ils jouent euh, ils jouent à Minecraft. Et quand ils ont vu que ça avait super bien marché, ils se sont dit bah voilà, hein, c'est pas juste un coup de chance. Les gens ils regardent pour nous. Et c'est là qu'ils se sont mis à faire euh, des vidéos un peu plus perso euh, sur leur vie, euh, sur euh, des trucs un peu plus euh, en, en dehors du, du gaming quoi. C'est ça. Et euh, du coup, bah, comme tu disais avec la, la maison, donc il euh, y a un truc avec le 6050, ce qui est assez drôle, c'est que du coup, c'était l'adresse de la maison qu'ils qu avaient pour Optique. Et quand euh, Nature est parti euh, fonder euh, 100 Thieves, bah, c'était exactement la même adresse, mais ailleurs. Quoi. Du coup, il y avait vraiment le 6050 qui, qui restait. Et après, tu lui as parlé de, de son tatouage. Et pour la petite anecdote, il disait qu'il l'avait il fait en même temps que celui que Temper a aussi. Euh, exactement. Donc, euh, voilà. Et je lui ai dit également, pourquoi est-ce que c'était important pour Optique d'avoir d'autres rosters, des rosters CSGO, Halo, etc. Et le but, c'était d'essayer d'aller chercher une nouvelle audience, d'essayer d'être plus qu'une team Call of Duty et d'être une grosse équipe au global, une sorte de grosse structure e-sport. Et c'est pour ça qu'ils avaient fait ça. À l'époque, il y avait la ligue Call of Duty qui allait se mettre en place. Ils savaient que Call of Duty allait demander beaucoup d'argent. Et c'est aussi à ce moment que ça a ramené des investisseurs. Et c'est là que d'ailleurs, je vais, je vais enchaîner. You, you spoke a little bit about like uh, the Call of Duty League, uh, where um, like uh, you, you knew that they were going to ask for a, a fat stack of money to, to, to get in. Uh, and maybe that's why you, at the time, uh, like you, as you said, Optic was profitable. Là, je l'ai pas dit, mais il a dit Optic était rentable à l'époque. C'était une des seules structures e-sport qui était rentable. C'est pour ça que c'était chaud pour les investisseurs de venir dedans. Uh, that's when, like I think in 2018, the, uh, the, the Texas Rangers came and invested uh, within Optic. Uh, why have you done it? And uh, was it necessary uh, to evolve? And what were the problems that you enco uh, encountered with the management at the time when uh, it went through? So the reason that I did it was because I understood. And as much as I, I would want to op for Optic to stay the same, because just because we were happy doesn't mean that the rest of the space who was trying to make a business out of it was going to be happy. I knew that there was teams out there that had massive investments, millions and millions of dollars plugged into them that they can take money from and say, Scump, I'll give you a million dollars to come play for me. And I, as his friend, can say, no. Don't take the million dollars. No, I can't, I, I, I gotta, I, gotta I, I have to see him succeed. Uh, although if, if I'm not helping you succeed, then I'm in the way. And my thought was, that's gonna happen, right? That, that, that is a reality that just because everyone here is happy making content and is only owned by us and this is what we do, doesn't mean that the rest of the space is gonna evolve yes. the same way. And I always always resent resented a lot of teams for, for sort of doing that. Um, but, you know, to each, to each person his own. Uh, but, you know, we, we didn't expand unless we were able to. So the, the harder we worked, the more money we got, the more money I invested into expansion into other teams. Um, because I knew the importance of it, as I mentioned before, guarding our new audience or being everywhere. So, you know, it, it, it was a little bit disheartening to have to do that because I was content, everybody else was, we weren't making millions of dollars, but we were also not losing any money. So we were living a life that we wanted to live in a 
Dope ass house. Profitable. Was, everything was good. You were having fun. Everything was good. But I knew that Call of Duty was going to be in the league. And I knew that if if Overwatch cost $20 million dollars to get in, I know that Call of Duty is going to be way more than that because it's a proven esport. It has a decade long of proven hard work and viewership that we help build. So in on that approach, I felt I'm like, man, you know, I, I don't want to do this, but it is something that I have to do in order to in order for optic to be optic and continue to be optic. I didn't just work, you know, 10 years of my life for to stop, right there. to stop to stop right there. I needed to see it through. And again, it was it was one of the toughest decisions that I made. I was scared, you know, letting go of, of something uh, so near and dear to me was you know, was, was a scary thing, but I, I, I was also tired of only being the, the, being the only person, me and my wife being the only people that actually like worked there, uh, that, that, that had a job and, and me managing the team and also creating content and also managing the house and also doing all that by myself. There was, there was a little bit of a, of a, of an opportunity for me to sort of voluntarily take my hands off uh, of this thing. And I had a really, a really good friend of mine that was, that was supposed to, you know, take over. Um, It ultimately, people just had different visions for for what the next iteration of Optic was going to be. My thought was, you know, once we do this, the gaming side is on autopilot, right? It's working. All you have to do is water the plant every so often. There's nothing to change. Let it be. Let it survive. Let's focus on the new thing, which is content. How much more content can we create that is going to push this thing even farther or further so for me it was it was that and the second that we we sort of started working together it just it, it just didn't didn't fit and uh and it you know I, i've told this story before but it wasn't until they they had a disagreement and they wanted to sell the call of duty team with scump in it to somebody else that i said enough because i was it's just i i i had worked so hard on on this brand and scump was such a big part of it that for, for us to let go of that was just, you know, it, it was heartbreaking to me. Um, and I just, I just couldn't let it go. I couldn't let it go. And, uh, and I fought for it. Alice, je t'en supplie, traduis leur ça parce que ça est vraiment une histoire de fou. Ouais, alors il disait qu'il savait que justement, que à un moment, ça allait arriver, euh, même si tout se passait bien et que tout le monde était content, genre ils étaient, ils étaient rentables, ils faisaient quand même de l'argent, ouais. il n'y avait aucune perte. Il savait qu'à un moment, bah, il, y avait des, il y avait des investisseurs qui pouvaient juste arriver et être en mode euh, voir les joueurs et dire, bah vas-y, euh, on va te donner plus d'argent. Ouais, genre, euh... Scum, je te donne un million de dollars, tu viens. Et en fait, c'était à l'époque où les grosses équipes commençaient à avoir tous des gros investisseurs qui mettaient plein de thunes et Optique ne pouvait pas trop rivaliser avec ça. Ouais, voilà, c'est ça. Et justement, comme il pouvait plus rivaliser, à un moment donné, il fallait qu'il prenne une décision. Et pour lui, c'était pas négociable de d'avoir perdu dix ans de travail comme ça dans le vent. Donc, il s'est dit bon, même si j'ai peur, on tente l'affaire, on va le faire et on va voir, euh, on va voir ce que ce que comment ça va marcher. C'est ça. Et euh, et du coup, euh, il disait qu'en plus. Euh, après, il y avait eu vraiment des, des gros désaccords parce que bah, pour lui, la partie gaming, ça marchait comme sur des roulettes. Il fallait juste faire regarder vite fait, mais il n'y avait plus rien à créer. Tout était déjà en route, mais pas que par contre sur le contenu. Il y avait déjà des visions un peu différentes, donc il y avait vraiment déjà des soucis par rapport à ça. Et en fait, le point de rupture, ça a été au moment où ils ont voulu vendre l'équipe Call of Duty avec Scump à l'intérieur, qu'il a dit euh, non, là, c'est trop, euh, on arrête, euh, c'est plus possible. Et c'est à ce moment-là qu'ils ont quitté et qu'ils ont du coup créé autre chose avec Chicago Guns semaine, notamment chez NRG, etc. Je vais un petit peu sauter ce passage-là, d'accord Pour euh, Ça fait quasi deux heures on est là, donc j'aimerais bien qu'on aille un petit peu plus tout, tout droit. Um, like, I'm gonna just a little bit skip about the Chicago and Semaine mm -hmm. part, etc. Uh, in 2020, you managed to negotiate with Immortals to buy back the rights of Optic. Uh, was it complicated Was it, like, expensive What was your feeling when... And then, what was your feeling when the, de the deal was signed, <coughs> which means, OK... We are going home. We take back our name and what we created. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was uh, the immortal side was really, really. They were gentlemen about it. Okay, they they, they, nice. they were very cooperative. Nice. Uh, can't say enough good things about them. Right? Uh, they they uh, they allowed me to to get my brand back. Um, uh, you know, like like anything else, there's 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 negotiations that happen, and uh, but yeah, overall it was, it was a, it was a really good transaction because I was able to get back what, what I believe was rightfully mine, it, right? It, it was, was. A, a birthright, right? For me to, to, to be the one that manages optic and takes it to the, to, to the next place, whatever that may be. Um, so yeah, look, I, I, I think 
I, I lost something. I lost myself when I left optic, but I knew that it was something that I needed to do, uh, in order to, to, you know, to, to sort of move on from, from, uh, from something that was so painful, right. From, for me. And, you know, I, I, at the end of the day, I was very happy with, with NRG. I was, you know, the relationship there was really good at, you know, Andy Miller, one of the, you know, the kindest, uh, the true gentleman also. Um, but you know, I, I, I had to follow my heart. You know, I, I, I worked so hard to build something that worked. I worked so hard to build a community. And I, 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 I always in the back of my head saw all of this success that had come to me, but in the back of it, I have this dark cloud that always says like, you're letting people down, you're letting people down, you're letting people down. And that hurt. It hurt so fucking much, man. I, 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 I lost sleep over it. I, it was always in the back of my head. I would see, you know, I would see this logo that was no longer, you know, mine. And it, it was, I lost myself. I lost myself for, for a very long time. And Huntsman was a really good opportunity to, you know, to, to sort of massage my own ego to say that, you know, although optic is that it's all about the people that, that we built a relationship with the logo uh, means nothing if the people weren't there. And if, if, you know, when, when we created a Huntsman, the majority of the green wall came with me yes. and, and you know, that again, I was like, they, they, they deserve better. And I'm not saying that Huntsman wasn't what they wanted, but there was something missing. And that thing, that intangible thing was, 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 was this. And, you know, when I, when I got the phone call from my lawyer and he's like, you don't have any interest in buying optic back do you. And I was like, Yes, tell him yes right now. Uh, we'll figure out the the rest of it later. And then when uh, the deal went through, and like the moment it was signed, and okay, now is the return. What was like the, your most raw feeling? Um, I wanted to cry. I didn't, but I wanted to because I I, I just I just saw the happiness in 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 my wife's eyes because she knew. I saw the happiness in my daughter's eyes. Right, like, this is this is something that I hope one day she can work at or, or, you know, a company that she can be, that she can be proud of. I saw Hitch being as happy as ever. Uh, I saw everybody just like, it, it, it was a full sort of like a, a good ending to a really, really dark part of my life. And that could have been it, right? They, 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 they could have been it. But when I got Optic and we got Optic, you know, Chicago back and it, it was, it was, uh, it was, a, it was a really, really good year. Um, I, you know, it, it's, It was one of the most painful things that I had to do, but in the end, it was a really good reward because it taught me, it taught me the importance of, of not giving up on something that you love. And I, and, and I learned the importance of, of what this means to me. Like I knew that this logo meant everything to me, but I didn't know what everything meant until I was, go I was separated from it. It's really beautiful. On était en train de parler de la période où justement ils avaient perdu un petit peu optique et le moment où ils ont pu du coup le racheter auprès d'Immortals. Ali, je te laisse leur décrire ça. Oui, alors euh, du coup, il expliquait que bah, Immortals, déjà, ils avaient été hyper sympas avec lui, vraiment. Euh, il a dit, euh, je les remercierai jamais, jamais assez pour, euh, pour tout ce qu'ils ont fait. Et, euh, et du coup, en fait, il racontait que vraiment cette, cette période-là, euh, quand, il, quand il était du coup à, à Huntsman, bah, c'était vraiment compliqué parce que il avait vraiment l'impression d'avoir laissé tomber tout le monde c'est ce que les gens lui disaient vu qu'il était parti de d'optique et c'était hyper douloureux vraiment c'était un, un énorme un énorme coup dur et euh, du coup même si Huntsman il avait récupéré une partie du Greenwall qui était venu avec lui il manquait quelque chose et il savait que c'était vraiment bah, tout ce qui est tout ce que optique euh, voulait dire pour lui ouais, et ça. quand son avocat l'a appelé et lui a dit euh, écoute est-ce que ça t'intéresse de racheter optique il est en mode euh, ok je explique-moi tout on va le faire et quand ça a été acté euh, il a dit qu'il voulait pleurer et en fait il voyait <rire> tout le monde dans son entourage toute la joie qu'il y avait et il s'est dit euh, c'est la c'est la bonne décision que, que j'ai faite quoi parce qu'au final c'était un happy ending mais toute cette période elle était tellement douloureuse et ça lui a rappelé que bah il, il se rendait pas compte de la chance qu'il avait d'avoir optique et en fait il s'en est rendu compte qu'au moment où il en était parti quoi et ça lui a montré qu'il fallait jamais abandonner les choses qu'on aimait Uh, right now, uh, I'm happy to say it, but uh, uh, Optic is the newest uh, Halo World Champion. Mm -hmm. You have a good roster on Call of Duty, yeah. Rocket League, and other games, even with the merger uh, with uh, Envy. Would the ambition of the structure like uh, to, to come back one day on one of the main games, like maybe League of Legends, CS:GO, or so? 
I mean, yeah, but you know, with with what we've learned, uh, I think that I making those decisions because of a financial decision is not necessarily the best approach. Uh, you know, I, I accomplished a lot. I, I'm very lucky to have been able to accomplish what I accomplished. When I bought Optic back, my my idea was. Okay, I, I got it back. I've this is my dream. I can die today and good story for Hector. Good story. But it wasn't the ending that Optic, you know, this this thing goes this optics forever. So for me, it's like what is what else is optic, right? What uh, this this time around, I wanted to focus more on innovating. I wanted to be I wanted to be more I would the, the same way that we transcended you know, gaming as a, as, as a team, when we played, you know, after playing, after transcending Call of Duty, playing Minecraft, I wanted to transcend, you know, gaming and esports, right? Like we, we, Optic is that, but we, I think are a little bit more than that. So I, I said, I'm going to go back to what made me passionate about this thing. And it's the creativity side of it. The, 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 the competition is nice and it's needed. You know, my, my views on the importance of it, but I wanted to, the pressure of, of, of being the best, done the pressure of being the biggest done what am i going to do now is what i i i sort of felt what is optic and um you know we're, we're a little bit more than that and until it gets proven out i think that it it will allow us to it'll allow us to truly prove out the fact that we started in gaming for sure but we're more than that right we we we're more than that. And I, the, the way that I see optic now, right. And it's, if, if you look at our, our, our Twitter handle, right. It's not optic gaming, it's optic. Right. And the reason that is that is because we're more than gaming. I yes. think that we're, we're, we've transcended that and we've been there for a long time, but now I see it clearer than ever that we are more than gaming. We, you know, the, the strategy of optic and what we built has worked in, in spaces outside of gaming. Right. If, if you look at, at, at a, at, at a company that I, that I sort of helped a friend advice again, all credit goes to to Rob Turkla, to you know Alex Perrick, to John B, to uh, Andrew Flair, and 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 the guys that that created Guggen. But it worked, right? The optic model worked in in the outdoor space, and they have they're they're the most popular, most disrupted brand in fishing. And you know, I I, I felt that you know because of that, and if and if we would have had it my way during the infinite days, like we would have had a fishing division, and it would have turned into what it did, right? Um, and again, not not and no point am I taking credit for the hard work that they yes. did because again, I can open doors and I can show you the way, but it's up to you to 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 do Get it. To the room. Um, and and I I thought so. Look, we're 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 doing a lot of a lot of good things outside of uh, outside of gaming, and I I it, it is it is incredibly important for me to to have an impact in not just gaming but the internet as a whole, the the new media as a whole, because I think that. You know, with with my imagination and creativity, I can see where this thing is going a lot easier than other people. I can focus on the things that I know are going to get us there quicker and safer, right? Without jeopardizing the stability of the company. Without so, having to go through this once again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know, it's uh, it was important for me to that this time around the same pressures that I that I talk about in creating content for professional players that I didn't put that pressure on me from a financial standpoint and I didn't put that 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 pressure on optic to be more than what it is because optic in in competition I mean think about the accomplishments the, the accomplishments that we've had this last year right we we won call of duty we won a championship in call of duty we won a championship in valorant we won a championship in halo uh like, you know, I, I don't want to say we're back because I don't think that we ever left ex because the spirit of optic lived through. But we're going to say you're doing good. Yeah. And I want to say that like that hard work from the players is going to continue to be there. So it's now my duty to sort of elevate what optic is into the next level so that everything else can be all about the competition, all about the, the, the creativity and all about the you know the pushing forward and reinnovation of, of what this thing becomes, um, and helping my players you know sort of achieve what they want to achieve in life is also like a, a big importance uh, of mine because again even though Scum for example like he's become such a savvy investor in the last three years mm -hmm. that it makes me proud to be sort of like there as I, as 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 you know as his team grows and as as, as he becomes a grown up right uh, I I think I think that I 
failed if I can't help my friends achieve the goals that they also want to achieve. It's really a really really good speech, and I will I will let like Alice uh, translate it, and then we will just uh, finish from now on because I think it's been two hours and it's been a pleasure. It really, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Alice. Je je te donne le relais. Alice, tu roules? Elle est pas là? Je je peux faire la traduction s'il faut que j'avais. Allô? Non, il eh n'y ben, a pas de souci. Alice a eu un petit souci technique, donc euh, je lui ai demandé si c'était important pour lui d'avoir à nouveau peut-être des équipes sur un, un jeu tier 1, comme par exemple League of Legends de CSGO. Et il disait qu'à l'heure actuelle, après avoir repris Optic, il s'est rendu compte que Optic, c'était plus qu'une simple team e-sport. C'était vraiment une sorte de mindset, tu vois, une sorte de truc qui est beaucoup plus grand que ça. Et qu'à l'heure actuelle, ils ont déjà des bons résultats sur Valorant, sur Halo, sur Call of Duty. Et qu'ils étaient déjà contents avec ce qu'ils avaient. Et qu'il était sûr qu'avec le développement qu'ils pouvaient apporter, sa vision, tout ça, machin, ils pourraient continuer à se produire et un petit peu se développer dans le temps euh, sans avoir à se remettre dans les risques qu'ils ont eu en 2018 quand ils ont laissé à Infinite une grosse part du gâteau ce qui a à la fin failli casser optique complètement donc du coup là à l'heure actuelle ils ont envie d'un développement beaucoup plus sain et c'est ce qu'ils recherchent c'est un petit peu ce qu'ils vont essayer de faire et à l'heure actuelle bah optique est dans une bonne place et c'est un petit peu sa, euh, sa, sa, sa vision pour le futur voilà voilà donc c'est une petite réponse un petit peu résumée je comptais quand même sur Alice pour la voir mais pour le coup elle a peut-être eu un petit souci technique donc il n'y a aucun souci à ça et ça vient clore un petit peu euh, l'interview ah bah tiens elle est dans le chat donc ça fait ça fait vraiment plaisir and we are coming to an end thank you Hector thank you so much for just like agreeing to come uh, when I as I said in the beginning you were the first one to just accept right when I came to you and uh, it's just the, the finish like uh, of the Zakhar Roulib USA uh, ah Well, look, Fr France is one of the most important pieces in esports, right? Like this isn't this is a global sport, and everybody needs to do their part. So you coming over here, like I understood the importance of it immediately. I obviously want to have a presence there. So if you don't follow me on Twitter, please do hit the translate button. You can understand more. Um, and I do appreciate uh, the, the the French Green Wall who understands us and has been with us for a very long time because it is when we went to ESWC in France, like the crowd was super super loud. You remember? Absolutely, it was one of the best crowds that we've ever experienced. I can remember clearly. We were playing uh, CT. In, uh, in Advanced Warfare yes. and the, the map there's like a it's like an Asian map it's got uh, like a Zen Garden and all that and we were playing and the crowd just like it 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 made me feel at home and I will always, always have a, a place in my heart for, for Paris. Les amis, franchement, je vais même pas le traduire ça. Je pense que même si vous parlez pas anglais, vous l'avez compris. Il adore et il a compris l'importance de la communauté française. Il se rappelle de l'ESWC quand Optic venait jouer et adorait euh, la, la, la passion qu'on avait. Et moi, je prends ces quelques instants. Je l'ai pris pour le remercier d'avoir accepté de venir. C'est le premier qui a directement accepté de venir dans un Corolib USA et je vais formellement euh, en rester là. J'espère que ça vous a plu. Ça a été une belle aventure humaine, une belle aventure de deux semaines dans lequel on a eu de très bons invités Crim6 euh, Hector ici présent Ludwig et également Temper en tout premier j'aurais dû avoir Scump malheureusement il a eu un petit imprévu donc ça arrive peut-être un jour maybe uh, Scump next time I come uh, I'll make it happen for you let's go il a dit la prochaine que je viens il va m'aider à réussir à avoir Scump donc ce serait vraiment exceptionnel j'espère que ça vous a fait plaisir les gars on prend vraiment du temps pour essayer de vous faire du contenu de qualité ça me tient à cœur donc euh, merci d'avoir répondu présent vous avez répondu présent que ce soit en live en rediff etc c'était vraiment super important je remercie également WeWard de nous avoir accompagné financièrement pour pouvoir faire en sorte que ça se passe WeWard n'hésitez pas le point d'exclamation WeWard est présent c'est une application où vous pouvez gagner des sous en marchant tout est gratuit et ça permet de soutenir le projet et faire en sorte que ça se passe donc c'est très important il y a également le ZAC euh, enfin le code euh, avec lequel vous pouvez euh, vous, en, euh, vous enregistrer sur l'application et gagner encore plus d'avantages donc je remercie merci WeWard merci les viewers thank you Hector once again merci Alice pour tout le travail qu'elle a fait sur cette euh, série et cette saison ZAC en USA c'est terminé Peut-être qu'on se retrouvera dans quelques mois, on ne sait jamais pour de nouveaux créateurs de contenu anglais. Et on se retrouve la semaine prochaine pour un épisode français cette fois à Paris et ce sera avec Omar Da Fonseca. Merci à vous d'avoir suivi et on vous souhaite une bonne fin de soirée. Bye